Part Two, Chapter One of Canada's Hundred Days with the Canadian Corps from Amiens to Mons, August eighth through November eleventh, nineteen eighteen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, Canyon City, Colorado. MikeVendetti.com. Canada's Hundred Days by John Liversley. Part Two, Chapter One. Planning Attack on Hindenburg Line. We have seen that Canadian Corps headquarters moved from a means to Hot Cloak on the morning of August twenty-second. Its stay here was of the briefest. The move being made early next morning to Noyelvion, and the interest of Hot Cloak in the annals of the Corps lies solely in the fact that here the plan of battle on the Arras front was prepared. Great as had been the moral effect of the successful Amiens offensive, followed up immediately by the attack of the Third Army between Albert and Arras, what was to follow was designed to be much more far-reaching in its effect, namely, the breaking of the Hindenburg Line, and the driving of the enemy on territory he had occupied uninterruptedly since 1914. Sir Douglas Haig thus explains the design. As soon as the progress of the Third Army had forced the enemy to fall back from the Mercatel Spur, thereby giving us a secure southern flank for an assault upon the German positions on Orange Hill and about Montchevre-le-Pre, the moment arrived for the First Army to extend the front of our attack to the north, using the river Sensee to cover their left. In the same way, the river Somme had been used to cover the left of the Fourth Army in the Battle of Amiens. The right of the First Army attacked east of Arras, and by turning from the north the western extremity of the Hindenburg line compelled the enemy to undertake a further retreat. It was calculated correctly that this gradual extension of our front of attack would mislead the enemy as to where the main blow would fall, and would cause him to throw in his reserves piecemeal. As we shall see, the entire operation was entrusted to the Canadian Corps, strengthened at times by the addition of British divisions. The recommendation of the Canadian Corps commander, made after the successful initial operations of the Battle of Amiens, namely that those operations should be slackened to give time to organize a set-piece attack, on a broad front, in a surprised attack elsewhere, had therefore borne its full fruit. In this connection, it is interesting to follow Sir Arthur Currie's observations upon the general situation at this date. In sympathy with the severe reverses suffered on the Marne, he says, and consequent upon the action now fully developed in the Somme salient, signs were not wanting that the enemy was preparing to evacuate the salient of the lies this evacuation began under pressure of the first army on august twenty fifth all these attacks and results direct or indirect enabled the allies to recover the ground they had lost in the course of the german offensive operations of the spring and summer the recapture of the ground was, however, of secondary importance as compared to the morale results of these successive victories. The German armies had been impressed in the course of these operations by the superiority of our generalship and our organization, and by the great determination of our troops and subordinate commanders. The Hindenburg system, however, was intact, and the enemy higher command hoped and believed that behind this powerfully organized area the German armies might be collected and reorganized. Fighting the most determined rear-guard action in the Somme salient, they expected that our armies would be tired and depleted by the time they reached the forward area of the Hindenburg system. The Battle of Cambrai, now about to begin, shattered their hopes by breaking through the Dortchkrient line itself, but a part of the Hindenburg system the Canadian Corps carried the operations forward to ground that had been in the hands of the Germans since 1914. This advance constituted a direct threat on the rear of the German armies, north and south of Cambrai. 
dominated at all times paralyzed by the swift and bold strokes on vital points of their line and by the relentless pressure applied everywhere the german higher command was unable to take adequate steps to localize and stop our advance after the drocourt quint line was broken the retreat of the enemy became more accelerated and our attacks met everywhere or with less and less organized and determined resistance the morale effect of the most bitter and relentless fighting which led to the capture of cambrai was tremendous the germans had at last learned and understood that they were beaten the operation is now about to open and which were not concluded until the fall of cambrai on october ninth regarded as one great battle ranks foremost in all the operations of the hundred days it entailed six weeks continuous fighting often surpassing in intensity any battle in which the canadian troops had ever been engaged and never falling below the standard of bitterest trench warfare for when as in mid-september there was a pause in the forward movement our troops in the front line were exposed in a sharp salient and had no rest by day or night throughout this great battle the canadian corps held the centre of the field and was often dependent entirely upon its own exertions and resources its work contributed more than any other combined operation of this period to the final downfall of the enemy arms these are considerable claims but they will be amply supported by the ensuing narrative the task before the canadian corps is described by sir arthur currie as follows on august twenty second i received the details of the operation contemplated on the first army front the plan was substantially as follows the canadian corps on the right of the first army was to attack eastward astride the arras cambrai road and by forcing its way through the duquart line south of the scarpe to break the hinge of the hindenburg system and prevent the possibility of the enemy rallying behind this powerfully organized defended area these operations were to be carried out in conjunction with the operation of the third army then in progress this attack had been fixed for next sunday august twenty fifth it was represented that this gave barely forty-eight hours to concentrate the necessary artillery part of which was still in the fourth army area and that furthermore the canadian corps had sentimental objections to attacking on the sabbath day it was then agreed the attack should take place on monday august twenty sixth on the evening of august twenty second i held a conference of divisional commanders at corps headquarters Hart cloquet and outlined the projected operation and my plans for carrying it out in addition to a detailed knowledge of the ground which we had held before we were particularly benefited by all the reconnaissances and plans made for the capture of orange hill during the period of simulated activity at the end of july the excellence of trench railways rear communications and administrative arrangements in the area were also of great value and enabled the canadian corps to undertake to begin with only three days notice the hardest battle in its history reinforcements had come up and although all units were not up to strength they were all in fighting condition the efficiency of the organization peculiar to the canadian corps and the soundness of the tactical doctrine practiced had been proved and confirmed flushed with the great victory they had just won and fortified by the experience acquired all ranks were ready for the coming task the first step must be the recapture of the territory overrun by the enemy in his spring offensive the most important feature was the conical hill rising out of the plateau between scarpe and the cambrai road known as monchet le pro this had been captured from the enemy by a very fine operation of british troops who in april nineteen seventeen had turned the position in a driving snowstorm as part of the program carried out south of the scarpe immediately following the capture of vimy ridge by the canadian corps in the face of furious counter-attacks lasting several days the hill had been held by the gallant newfoundland regiment who although cut to pieces clung desperately to the position until support was forthcoming it was one of the tragedies of the spring of nineteen eighteen that monchet le pro was perhaps needlessly surrendered to the enemy 
Those were days of panic, and the loss of the hill seriously embarrassed the troops, including the 2nd Canadian Division, holding the line in front of Arras during the summer. It was certain that the enemy would not give it up again without a desperate struggle. There were other strong features. For the ground to be attacked lent itself peculiarly to defense, being composed of a succession of ridges, rivers, and canals, which formed natural lines of defense of very great strength. These natural positions, often mutually supporting, had been abundantly fortified. Their organization was the last word in military engineering, and represented years of intensive and systematic labor. Barbed wire entanglements were formidable. Machine gun positions innumerable, and large tunnels had been provided for the protection of the garrison. The four main systems of defense, says the Corps commander, consisted of the following lines. 1. The old German front line system, east of monchet le 2. The Française Rovoy line. 3. The dorchet Coinet line. And 4. The Canal du Nord line. These, with their subsidiary switches, were strong points as well as the less organized but by no means weak intermediate lines of trenches made the series of positions to be attacked without doubt one of the strongest defensively on the western front broad glaciers studded with machine-gun nests defended the immediate approaches to these lines and this necessitated in each case heavy fighting to gain a suitable jumping-off line before assaulting the main position in addition to these systems and as a preliminary to the attack on the old German trench system east of the Monchet le Pré, it was necessary to capture the very well-organized British defenses which had been lost in the fighting of March 1918. These defenses were intact to the depth of about 5,500 yards and were dominated by the heights of Monchet le Pré, from which the Germans were enjoying superior observation. Throughout these operations, there could not be any element of a surprise other than that afforded by the selection of the actual hour of the assaults. The positions to be attacked formed the pivot of the movements of the German army to the south, and the security of the armies to the north depended also on these positions being retained. There was consequently little doubt that the enemy was alert and had made every disposition to repulse the expected attacks. Therefore, the plan necessitated provision for very hard and continuous fighting, the main stress being laid on the continuity of the operations. To carry this out, I decided to do the fighting with two divisions in the line, each on a one-brigade front, thus enabling both divisions to carry on the battle for three successive days. The two other divisions were to be kept in corps reserve, resting and refitting after each relief. The severity of the fighting did not, however, allow this plan to be adhered to, and on many occasions the division had to fight with two brigades in the front line. It was understood that British divisions from Army Reserve would be made available as soon as additional troops were required. To maintain the utmost vigor throughout the operation, the divisions were directed to keep their support and reserve brigades close up ready to push as soon as the leading troops were expended. Six terrible weeks were to follow. They were to test the Corps as it had never been tested before. Days were to come in which it was to envision defeat and triumph only by its stern denial of such a possibility. For all it was to be a fiery ordeal, but for none more than the Corps commander. He had taken on the task and for the honor of the Corps of Canada and the good of the cause. He must push it through to a victorious conclusion. Be sure there were for him days of doubt and sorrow. But his lofty spirit, certain of itself, even as it was certain of the Canadian soldier, triumphed over all. Some few, in intimate touch with the Corps commander, in the dark days may have guessed any burden that at times was almost overwhelming, of responsibilities that troubled the humane man. But to those who relied upon him he showed only a serene fortitude, and quickened their drooping spirits by the vitality of his faith. One of the divisional commanders has written of the grateful thanks of all ranks of the division to our chief, Sir Arthur Currie. 
for the extraordinary skill and ability with which he conducted these battles and especially do we wish to place on record our appreciation of the care and solicitude which he has evinced at all times for our lives and general well-being end of part two chapter one recording by mike vendetti canyon city colorado mike vendetti dot com part two chapter two of Canada's Hundred Days with the Canadian Corps from Amiens to Mans, August 8th through November 11th, 1918. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesey. Part 2. Chapter 2. Wayside Scenes. Meantime, preparations are going busily on. On the night of August 19th, the 2nd Canadian Division began to move back to its fighting ground in front of Arras, where it had arrived on March 30th in time to halt the enemy assault on Arras, remaining in the same line with a brief interval until the move south was made. Units of this division now found themselves back in the identical trenches they had held so many weeks. The 3rd Canadian Division began its move the following night, and was followed immediately by the 1st Division but our 4th Division remained in the line in front of Roy until August 25th, when it was relieved by the 34th and 35th French Divisions, and did not rejoin the Corps until August 28th, after the battle had opened. The Canadian troops had been fighting in a country relatively little war-scarred, where green fields and growing things were to be seen. They had had the luck of an unbroken spell of fine weather. Granted, the hard toil and ever-present danger of the soldier's lot, their excursion south had been something in the nature of a break in the dull monotony of trench warfare, an adventure full of life and color and movement. Now they were coming back to no man's land, to the pitiless desolation wrought by the static warfare of years, to mud and mire and the clang of the gas alarm. Such was to be their life, until long weeks ahead they had passed over the Canal du Nord, through the scarred wood of Bourlon, and had fought their way again to green fields across the Scheldt Canal. But not the hardiest optimist nor the most imaginative soldier in their ranks could at that time guess that anything lay in front of them but another winter in the trenches. Passing in trains and buses through August harvest scenes, their eyes were blinded to the great panorama presently to unroll before them the towers of Valenciennes, the slag heaps of Hanault, the belfry of Mons, the dark forests of the Ardennes, and the shining ribbon of the Rhine. They had had their little excursion, their adventure, their holiday, and now, somewhat grimly, they returned to a landscape rent by war from the very form of nature, and to the dreary round of raid by night and alarms by day. We are camped in the orchard of noyel Villon, ten miles west of Arras. It is unscorched by war, and its people go about their daily avocations, habituated to the continual shifting military population. We follow hard on an American divisional staff. Their footprints are still fresh in the damp orchard mold, and they in turn some British troops. The tradition of French units there in the early months of the war is already indistinct. English is the language of barter, and children lisp it. One wonders whether this movement is welcome to the peasants. The idea of being their saviors has passed into history. We must be something of a nuisance. True, they are paid for their billets, but in turn they must evacuate their homes or crowd into narrow quarters. Home life ceased for these peasants four years ago. They are mere appendages of a vast and complex military movement, restless, seeming purposeless, that at an hour's notice picks up the major population of the village, whisks it from sight and memory, save perhaps in a shy maiden heart, and before nightfall deposits a new, strange, but still alien multitude in khaki. Shops, houses, estaminets, have sunk their identity in the bold conspicuousness numbering of the billets. The maiden sisters du Bouc, whose little dressmaking parlour stood just back from the street and was a favourite corner for gossip among the good wives, have disappeared. God knows where. Peace will bring them back, but the gate that looked down the cobbled street as they plied their busy needle is now disfigured by the sign. Number 37. Billets for 18 men. Mankind has the instinct to climb upward, survey what lies below of the countryside, and catch maybe the sun's declining rays. Back of the orchard, 
gently rising ground leads one up to one of the finest prospects in France. Not bold, indeed, like the view from Castle, but on every hand undulating into purple distances. Peace here reigns. In the foreground women with kilted skirts are milking. An old man steadily follows his plough. Up the road, perched sideways on a farm horse, her sabots clicking against the chain traces, rides a young girl, a white kerchief bound coquettishly over her dark hair, going home to prepare the evening meal. At the hour of vespers for countless generations these same people have been doing these same tasks. The war has not touched them visibly, save that it has snatched from the village sturdy manhood and lusty youth. Below lies a vista of dark, ploughed land, yellowing fields of sugar-beet, tender green of sprouting grain, and umbrageous clumps enclosing trim villages. Nothing could be more sylvan, more caressing to the eye. But at our very feet is a line of trench, leaving its white, serrated scar, hastily thrown up in those feverish spring days when it seemed Eris too must fall in the general ruin. What is that mass that gleams on the eastern skyline? The glass shows the familiar lines of the broken towers of the great church of Mont saint Eloi, a landmark for miles around, to be seen at a later date quite as distinctly from the hilltop of Monchy de Pru. And then that faint outline must be Vimy Ridge, with its crowding memories. To the left stand out the wooded summits bordering Notre Dame de Lorette. War is not so distant. From an aerodome in the valley rises a solitary airman, and a while he disports himself in the blue. Soon the sharp purr of his engine is overhead. He turns, careening his machine, whose belly gleams ruddy in the blazing western sky, a darting dragonfly. Presently he is joined by the rest of his bombing squadron. In perfect alignment, like a flight of geese over a northern lake, they turn eastward on their grim errand. In the little town of Duisson, but a stone's throw west of Arras, a procession of clergy and pious laymen bearing banners and tall candles pass up the hill to the church. This is a day of thanksgiving for the villagers. The legend goes that in those fateful days of August, 1914, when the Huns swept through Arras into the country beyond, the aged curé called together the devout, and earnestly they besought Our Lady that if she would shield them from the invader, annual offerings would be made at the shrine. A party of Uhlans rode up to the town, Octra Post, inquired if troops were there, and then returned whence they came. Shells fell about the outskirts, neighboring villages were shattered, but not a pagan finger-mark touched Duisson. Worn out with the load of the terrible years, the old priest died, but still the parish pays its annual tribute. Presently are heard strains of Gregorian music. In our orchard is much speculation as to when and where the corps will go in again. It rains a good deal, the ground is clayey, and rash folks say any move will be to the good. It is Sunday night, August 25th. Heine has been over, and one of our fellows after him. An officer with a night-glass claims that he saw him come down. An orderly comes to the tent with an urgent message. In a few minutes we are pulling boots on again and going down the hill to the corps garage. It is after midnight. The attack is to be at three o'clock. There is little time to spare. Soon Noyel Villon is behind us, and we pass through Habarc, famous, we have been told, for its beautiful women. Presently we come out upon the broad St. Paul Arras Highway, and broad it need be to take care of the traffic this night. No lights are allowed, for all this road is under direct observation. The moon, just past the full, keeps slipping behind clouds, and we crawl forward slowly. We pass gun limbers pulled by six horses apiece, whose black feet make a pattern on the wet, shining road. Dense columns of four swing steadily forward. The identification patch is French-gray, and therefore the third Canadian division, but we can make out nothing further. No stretch of the imagination can render Arras beautiful, but there is a certain picturesqueness in the narrow streets, exposing to the night air their gaping wounds. It is a tortuous passage, and just where traffic space is most needed, a wall of sandbags has been built across the road. Past the ruined railway station we go, across a bridge and then up a long hill, through ruins that were once the faubourg Gromby, and so into other ruins that once was the village of Beaurain. In a dugout here is a company headquarters, where men going up the line are being served hot tea, grateful and refreshing. The car can go no further, but it is only a matter of a mile to Telegraph Hill, which offers a good view of the battle. 
it has begun to rain a driving rain from the west, cold and cheerless, and it is slow work picking one's way through wire and trenches, stumbling over a soldier's grave or slipping into a shell-hole. Zero hour, in fact, bursts on our ear from a field battery unnoticed in a little wood a few hours behind us. The battle is on, but nothing can be made out in the darkness. The barrage, we have been told, is more intense than that even of the opening of the Amiens show, but somehow it is not so impressive. The front is narrower, and the horizon limited by ridges. There is not the same wide sweep of vision that made the spectacle from Gentel ever memorable. Nevertheless, it is effective, as the enemy's flares show. Very soon there is the glimmer of dawn, and gradually the battlefield unfolds as though a transparency. Getting back to the road that runs from Bahrain to Nubia Vitas, we meet already some of our walking wounded. One of these drives before him thirty prisoners. They expected us today, he calls out, but we were an hour too early for them. These lazy beggars were asleep in their dugout. How's the battle going? Why, fine. We're away over the hill by now. But he adds that the machine gunners are stout chaps and gave it his section bad. Over the entrance to a dugout is a boldly painted sign. This is Nouvelle Vitas. That ruin needed identification. Our 31st Battalion, Southern Alberta, had captured part of the village or the trench system that goes under that name, but the previous night, and fighting was still going on in the other end. Further to the right we now see our men, a straggling line, making good progress a mile or so inside the enemy line. But the enemy is shelling the sunken road going through the village, and one is well advised to take to a trench. In fact, it is a very different affair to Amiens, where our men sailed off into the blue, and were not brought up until they had got in four or five miles. Our counter-battery work then silenced his guns, but now he is putting up a fight for every yard of ground and sending over big stuff on our supply lines. Against the skyline a tank lies derelict, and our line, now very thin, is scattered into little groups, answering the enemy machine-gun fire. Slowly, troops in support work forward. An advanced dressing station is busy in the fold of the hill just behind Nouville Vitas. Long lines of our wounded wait patiently, lying in the open on stretchers. Nearby is a brigade headquarters. News that men of the 3rd Division have captured Monchy Le Preux evokes a cheer. "'Good old CMRs!' whispers a private of the 31st. One wonders if he can make Blighty. His face is the color of parchment, but he lies there waiting his turn without complaint." A big fellow in field gray next to him groans horribly. Down the shell-torn road come long lines of stretcher-bearers. One of these little parties is scattered by a bursting charge. The surgeons, in their white aprons, work on impassively. End of Part 2 Chapter 2。Part 2 Chapter 3 of Canada's Hundred Days with the Canadian Corps from Amiens to Mons, August 8th through November 11th, 1918. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Canada's Hundred Days by John Lively. Part 2, Chapter 3, Operations, August 26th through August 27th. The attack on the morning of August 26th was to be launched by the 2nd Canadian Division Major General Sir Henry E. Burstall on the right and the 3rd Canadian Division Major General L. J. Lipset on the left. With a total frontage of 6,000 yards, the jumping-off line began at the sugar factory just south of Nouvelle Vitasse. Passing north through that village, then a little east of Telegraph Hill across the arras Cambrai Road, the divisional boundary just east of tolles les mofolines thence northeast to the Scarpe River at Fampox, north of which the line was taken up by the 51st Division, for the purpose of this operation placed under orders of the Canadian Corps commander. This famous Highland Division, as part of the 22nd Corps, had been through all the hard fighting on the Marne in July, and had good reason to be a little battle-weary. To protect the flank of our 3rd Division, the 51st Division, was to advance towards Mont Pleasant and Roe. On our right, the 17th Corps, the left corps of the 3rd Army, during the offensive of the preceding week, had advanced its line well forward of our right flank 
to the outskirts of Crossels, whence its front trended back northwesterly to join up with us at Nouvelle Vitasse. This corps was to follow up any advantage the Canadian Corps might gain. On the previous night, Saturday, August 24th, our 2nd Division had secured a better jumping-off line by advancing its outposts into the western edge of Nouvelle Vitasse, pursuing this advantage by capturing the sugar factory and some elements of trenches south of the village. The original design was that our two divisions should push their attack due east, but after the battle was initiated, this was changed, the Cambrai road being made the divisional boundary line, the direction being southeast. The first task set for the second division was the capture of Chapel Hill, and it was then to work south through the old British support system and join up with troops of the 17th Corps, on the right, on the northern end of Juan Court Spur, the object being to throw a dragnet around the enemy troops in their forward area toward Nouvelle Vitasse. The left of the division was to push forward simultaneously and capture the southern end of Manche le Pro. The third division was to capture Orange Hill first and then pass on to the attack on Manche le Pro. Both divisions were to exploit their successes as far as possible. After mature consideration, zero hour, which had been originally set at 4.50 a.m., was changed to 3 a.m., says Sir Arthur Curry, in order to take advantage of the restricted visibility produced by moonlight and so to effect a surprise. The attacking troops would thus pass through the enemy's forward machine-gun defenses by infiltration and be in position to assault at dawn his line of resistance on the eastern slopes of Orange Hill. The initial assault was to be supported by seventeen brigades of field and nine brigades of heavy artillery. Throughout the arras cambrai operations, the artillery allotted to the Canadian Corps was at all times adequate, varying at times in accordance with the tasks assigned. In the operation against the Dauchoit Crank line, the attack was supported by twenty brigades of field and twelve brigades of heavy artillery. The following troops were attached to the Canadian Corps for the operation. 5th Squadron, RAF. 3rd Brigade, Tank Corps, about 45 tanks to a brigade. As a result of lessons learned during the Amin's operations, it was laid down as a general principle that tanks should follow rather than precede the infantry. The 3rd Tank Brigade was asked to supply, if possible, nine tanks to each attacking division each day, and the necessity of exercising the greatest economy in their employment was impressed on divisional commanders. On August 26th at 3 a.m., the attack was launched. Under the usual artillery and machine-gun barrages, it made good progress, the village of Monche le pre being entered early in the day after a very brilliant encircling attack carried out by the 8th Brigade, Brigadier General D.C. Draper. The trenches immediately to the east of Monche le pre were found to be heavily held and were not cleared until about 11 a.m. by the 7th Brigade, Brigadier General H.M. Dyer. Guantamp was captured at 4 p.m., and Wancourt Tower and the top of Hanel Ridge were in our hands at 10.40 p.m. The defenders of the latter feature fought hard, but eventually succumbed to a determined attack delivered by the 6th Brigade, Brigadier General A. H. Bell, under cover of an extemporized barrage fired by the 2nd Canadian Division Artillery, Brigadier General H. A. Panette. During the night, this brigade captured in addition Egret Trench, thus securing a good jumping-off line for the operation of the following day. The situation along the arras road was at one time obscure following a change in the interdivisional boundary ordered when the attack was in progress. A gap occurred for a few hours, but it was filled as soon as discovered by the Canadian independent force. The enemy fought strenuously, and several counterattacks were repulsed at various stages of the fighting, three German divisions being identified during the day and more than 2,000 prisoners captured together with a few guns and many machine guns. North of the Scarpe, the 51st Highland Division had pushed forward east of the chemical works and Garvel without meeting serious opposition. Our average advance the first day was about 6,000 yards, covering what had been the sharp enemy salient thrust to within two miles of Arras into a fairly uniform line projected forward by our two divisions on our right to within a thousand or fifteen hundred yards of the old german front line and on our left south of the scarpe at pelves actually a little over that line thus giving us virgin territory 
he had held since 1914. It was an auspicious beginning. On our right, the 17th Corps, after some delay, had conformed to our advance through Hanel, but on our left, north of the Scarpe, the situation was not quite so satisfactory, for the 51st Division had orders to cooperate but not to attack, and during the day did not advance more than a thousand yards on the river, thus being at least as much behind our men who had established themselves in the western outskirts of Pelves. Although the task of our 2nd Division was not so spectacular as the work allotted to the 3rd Division on their left, it was far from easy. The enemy alert to meet attacks already developing in this sector had pushed forward reinforcements. Our advance developed well along the Cambry Road, but when our troops sought by a turning movement to link up with the 17th Corps, the fighting became very severe, each ridge providing a separate battlefield, and already the enemy was showing what lay in store for us when his main line of resistance was reached. On the right, the 6th Brigade, Brigadier General A. H. Bell, attacked with the 29th Battalion of Vancouver on the brigade right, and the 27th Battalion of Winnipeg on its left. These battalions pushed forward due east on each side of Nouvelle Vitasse, the 27th swinging around and closing in on the back of the village, and then continued the advance to Wancourt village, which was taken on schedule. Meantime, the 29th Battalion had swung off at right angles in an endeavor to secure contact with troops of the 3rd Army. This difficult maneuver was well carried out, a number of prisoners and guns being captured in Nouvelle Vitasse. Advancing to capture Wancart Ridge, both battalions were held up by terrific machine-gun fire and proceeded to make good a line of defense. The 31st Battalion, Southern Alberta, and the 28th Battalion, Regina, now came up in support and with aid of an admirable shot put down by the 2nd Division Artillery, the ridge was finally cleared and one court tower captured at half-past four that same afternoon. That night, the brigade pushed forward and captured a line of trench ahead to furnish the 5th brigade with a good jumping-off line next morning. The right battalion of the brigade was obliged to build up a flank to the south, as the British troops had not come up. Meantime, the 4th Brigade, Brigadier General R. Rennie, on the left of the 6th Brigade after storming Chapel Hill, had pushed on south of the Cambry Road, with Bretnell's brigade now on their left, overcoming heavy opposition at Grampaia and along the swampy valley of the Cajol. The 4th Brigade attacked at 3.20 a.m. and by 6 a.m. had reached its first objective, the 21st Battalion, Eastern Ontario, on the right, and the 20th Battalion, Central Ontario, on the left. The final objective was reached at 7.30 a.m., with Quintop captured later by the 21st Battalion, the 19th Battalion, Central Ontario, and the 18th Battalion, Western Ontario, now came up in support, and by 7 in the evening the line had been carried forward to the northern slope of the Hanel Ridge. On our left, on the 3rd Canadian Division front, the dramatic feature of the day was the capture of Manche le pro the commanding height known to every soldier on the Arras front, and this brilliant exploit is deserving of description in some detail. The attack was entrusted to the 8th Brigade, Brigadier General D.C. Draper. At zero, our artillery put down a heavy rolling barrage, moving forward at the rate of a hundred yards every four minutes on the enemy's front line and defenses, in conjunction with defensive barrages designed to prevent the enemy bringing up reinforcements. The 5th, 4th, and 2nd Canadian Mounted Rifle Battalions jumped off exactly at zero, following closely upon the rolling barrage. At 25 minutes past 5, when visibility was good, the 1st Canadian Mounted Rifle Battalion, Western Manitoba, and Saskatchewan passed through the 4th and 2nd Canadian Mounted Rifle Battalions on our left attacking the enemy positions between the Scarpe River and the northern slopes of Manche le Pré. The attack was pressed with vigor, and by seven o'clock our men had accomplished their tasks, and the final objectives were in their hands, but they did not stop until they had advanced some distance further east. The right flank swung around behind Manche le Pré, joining hands at eight o'clock with the 5th Canadian Mounted Rifles, Eastern Townships, which had attacked on the right, capturing Orange Hill and then drifting parties up to the southwest of the village. Seeing themselves thus cut off from support, the garrison surrendered. During the advance, our troops encountered and overcame stiff resistance, chiefly machine-gun fire, and particularly from the village. No sooner were they in possession of the hill than the enemy turned upon it a furious bombardment, with trench mortars and heavy guns. 
at eleven o'clock units of the seventh brigade passed through the line and pressed on the advance leaving the fifth brigade to consolidate the position they had so gallantly won in this brilliant encircling movement the first canadian mounted rifles inflicted severe casualties on the enemy besides capturing a large number of prisoners several heavy and light trench mortars a great number of heavy and light machine guns together with two seventy seven millimeter guns fell into their hands there remains to be recorded a notable personal exploit after the encircling movement was completed but while the enemy still held the hill crowned with the ruins of manche le brace lieutenant charles smith rutherford fifth canadian mounted rifle a native of colborne ontario went forward alone to reconnoiter some distance ahead of his assaulting party entering the outskirts of the village he walked straight into an enemy machine-gun section holding a pillbox but which was not looking for an attack from that quarter surrender he cried without a moment's hesitation though covered by enemy rifles you are completely surrounded and our machine-gunners will open fire on you if you do not surrender immediately the enemy officer disputed the fact and invited rutherford to enter the pillbox but this he discreetly declined there was a moment's discussion and then the german officer said they would surrender you have another machine-gun further up the hill order them to surrender or we'll blow them to bits and they did the entire garrison consisting of two officers and forty-three men with three machine-guns surrendered to him his men then coming up lieutenant rutherford observed that the right assaulting party was held by heavy machine-gun fire from another pillbox. this he attacked with a lewis gun section and captured a further thirty-five prisoners with machine-guns thus enabling the party to continue their advance orange hill west of manche le pre was covered by a strong enemy trench line and some of the numerous dugout were not mopped up thoroughly as our infantry pushed ahead father james nicholson of kingston ontario chaplain of the fifth canadian mounted rifles went over with his medical officer and stretcher bearers after the infantry coming to a dugout the padre shouted down don't shoot cried a boche officer we surrender and up thumbed seven officers and forty men piling their arms but where are your men asked the leader looking around suspiciously never mind prepare to go to the rear they began to whisper together at this moment the m o arrived with his stretcher bearers but all unarmed that is quite enough from you one word more and off goes your block he said walking up to the boche fortunately at that juncture two of our men with rifles came up shoot the first man that opens his mouth said the m o captain h b mcallen and they marched off to the rear after passing through the eighth brigade the seventh brigade had very stiff fighting along the valley of the scarpe and also toward the buis du vert and the buis du start from which the enemy launched heavy counter-attacks during the course of that afternoon and evening but these were beaten off and our line consolidated for the attack next morning the attack says the corps commander was renewed at four fifty five a m on august twenty seventh by the second and third canadian divisions in the face of increased opposition under a uniformly good initial barrage the second canadian division pushed doggedly forward through the old german trench system where very stiff hand-to-hand -hand fighting took place and crossed the sensei river after capturing the villages of chasse and vis en artios the third canadian division encountered very heavy opposition but succeeded in capturing bois du vert bois du sart and reaching the western outskirts of hancourt remy berry notre dame and Belvis. the enemy throughout the day pushed a large number of reinforcements forward bringing up machine-gun units in mortar lorries in the face of our accurate field and artillery fire hostile field batteries in the open firing over open sights showed remarkable tenacity several remaining in action until the personnel had been destroyed by our machine-gun fire our casualties were heavy especially on the second canadian division front and after discussing the situation with the g o c second canadian division and taking into consideration the uncertainty of the right flank of this division the operations were after five forty five p m restricted to the consolidation of the line then reached east of the sensei river north of the scarpe the fifty first highland division had pushed forward and gained a footing on greenland hill but were forced to withdraw slightly by a heavy german counter-attack during the night of august twenty seventh and twenty eighth the eighth division seventh corps took over the northern half of the fifty first division front 
as the enemy was still holding pluvian and the high ground north of the scarpe the third canadian division had been compelled to refuse its left flank and the front now held by the division was increased from about thirty seven hundred yards to about six thousand yards the fact was that while during this day the canadian corps advanced a maximum of about four thousand yards along the cambrai road there was no corresponding advance by the british troops on either flank particularly on the north where the failure to hold greenland hill was a sad loss as enemy batteries on this elevation directed at us an enfilade fire throughout this and the following days the situation was very clear to the onlooker on top of manche le Bro, at times itself a warm spot the main supply of ammunition for both our division was along the iris cambrai road and this was subjected to a harassing fire along its entire length several ammunition lorries were hit south of manche and casualties were suffered by our advanced dressing station in that vicinity all the fire coming from the north right across the supports of our third division on our right the second canadian division had a hard day of it right from the kick-off the attack was made by the fifth brigade on the right which during the night had relieved the sixth brigade and the fourth brigade on the left immediately south of the raris cambrai road the fifth brigade had a terrible grueling fighting its way through a dense maze of trenches and wire and with its right flank in the air all its battalions were engaged and lost very heavily these being the twenty fourth recruited from the victoria rifles of montreal the twenty second french canadians the twenty fifth nova scotia and twenty sixth new brunswick lieutenant colonel w h clark kennedy of the twenty fourth enlisted at montreal showed this day conspicuous bravery and brilliant leadership he led his battalion with great bravery and skill from crow and Argate trenches in front of wancourt to the attack on the francis Rovay line from the outset the fifth brigade of which the twenty fourth was a central unit came under very heavy shell fire and machine-gun fire suffering many casualties especially among the leaders units became apparently disorganized and the advance was checked appreciating the vital importance to the brigade front of a lead by the centre and undismayed by annihilating fire lieutenant colonel clark kennedy by sheer personality and initiative inspired his men and encouraged them forward on several occasions he led parties straight at the machine-gun nests which were holding up the advance by controlling the direction of neighboring units and collecting men who had lost their leaders he rendered valuable services in strengthening the line and enabled the whole brigade front to move forward by the afternoon very largely due to the determined leadership of this officer in disregard for his own life his battalion despite its heavy losses had made good the maze of trenches west of chersey and chersey village and crossed the sensei bed and had occupied the occident trench in front of the heavy wire of the franchise rovoy line under continuous fire he then went up and down his line until far into the night improving the position giving wonderful encouragement to his men and sending back very clear reports on the left of the second canadian division front the fourth brigade had equally hard fighting it captured vis and the arras cambrai road early but it was unable to cross the sensee river until late in the day undeterred by their losses these fine ontario units fought their way literally step by step until they had made good the east bank of the sensee the fighting was very bitter in character and the twenty first battalion in particular was little inclined to mercy after a boche prisoner had shot down one of their officers from Manche, it was clear that a stern battle was in progress up over the high ridge from Wancourt and Guimap, and then down into the valley of the Sesame River, through the strongly fortified village of the Christie and Vicin Artios. From the opposite slope, the enemy poured in a terrific fire, and from time to time he threw in counterattacks with his infantry. It was slow and expensive work, but it was virtually necessary to unmask the Francais Roble line, the last line of resistance which lay between us and our immediate goal the drote court quince which itself an integral part of the hindenburg system equally intense but of a different character was the fighting on the front of the third division on our left we were now fighting in the no man's land of nineteen seventeen and the ground was everywhere torn up by shell fire and littered with old wire the seventh brigade had carried the line overnight in front of the voice du vert and voice du start two woods crowning twin heights a thousand yards apart north and south manche being two thousand yards west a thousand yards northeast of bois du sart lies jigsaw wood with hatchet wood between 
the ninth brigade took up the attack at zero hour the immediate objective being these two woods and if possible the advance was to be pushed into the barre notre dame a mile further east the two woods were taken in the first rush but the enemy meanwhile had brought down heavy reinforcements from douai and counter-attacked three times in succession from jigsaw wood compelling us to refuse our left which here as already explained exposed a long flank to the north in order to cope with the resistance it was determined to lay down a hurricane barrage on jigdal wood and for this purpose four brigades of field artillery and a dozen batteries of heavy guns were concentrated on orange hill and opened fire simultaneously as luck would have it the enemy had just pushed in strong supports to their troops holding jigsaw wood and the slaughter was very great our bombing planes flying over the wood at the same time added to the destruction and confusion the enemy however had a strong second line of defense and both Bouillor and Jigsaw Wood remained in his hands this day. On its right, however, the 3rd Canadian Division succeeded in advancing its line north of the Cambrai Road abreast of our 2nd Division at Vizen Artois. The battle was intensifying as it progressed, but there was harder fighting yet to come. End of Part 2, Chapter 3 Recording by Mike Vendetti, Canyon City, Colorado, MikeVendetti.com Part Two, Chapter Four of Canada's Hundred Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James O'Connor. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesay. Part Two, Chapter Four operations august twenty eighth it was intended says sir arthur currie to continue the battle on august twenty eighth with the first canadian division on the right and the fourth british division then coming under my command on the left the latter division however was unable to reach the battle position in time as it was undesirable at this stage to employ a fresh division alongside a division which had been already engaged the orders issued were cancelled and the battle was continued by the divisions then in the line in fact there was no choice in the matter as we have seen the fourth canadian division was then only moving back from amiens the enemy was pushing up reinforcements from both douay and cambrai and evidently meant to throw every available ounce into the scale to check us before the drocourt cant line was reached. He held an immensely strong position on the eastern slopes rising up from the Cincy River, which was continued by the Boiry defense line to the Scarp. He had shown a disposition to attack in force, and the positions we had won offered no facilities for a passive defense. We must either go on or fall back on Wancourt Ridge and Monchy, thus throwing away the fruits of two days' hard fighting and all the advantages of our surprise attack. It was not to be thought of, and so until two fresh divisions could be brought into the line the following night at earliest, there was nothing for it but for our tired troops to press on. The day's operations are described by the Corps commander as follows. At 9 a.m. on August 28th, the 3rd Canadian Division resumed the attack, followed at 12.30 p.m. by the 2nd Canadian Division. The objective for the day was the capture of the friend rouvroy line, the possession of which was vital to the success of our further operations. On the left, the 3rd Canadian Division had pushed forward, capturing the friend rouvroy line from the Cincy River to north of Boiry, Notre Dame, and had secured that village, Jigsaw Wood, and entered Pelves. They had, however, been unable to clear the village of Haucourt. In order to shorten their front and reduce to a minimum the risk of a counter-attack from the north, the 51st Division being still at Rue, our third division opened the day by an assault at seven o'clock on their extreme left when by the capture of pelves they secured that bridgehead over the scarp this was brilliantly carried out by the seventh brigade brigadier general h m dyer whose elements fought their way through an intricate maze of trenches 
despite the galling fire poured in on them from the heights bordering the river valley further east it was the scene of a very brilliant exploit sergeant john hutchinson of the forty ninth battalion of edmonton a native of newcastle but who enlisted at edmonton led the way up an enemy communication trench which projected forward at right angles from their main system bombing as he went he fought along the trench to the t-point where it joined the main trench where he established himself and sent back word that the left of the enemy sector based on the river was now in the air reinforcements were rushed up and our men divided right and left along the main trench and soon were in complete possession across the bare open ground from the east the enemy sent over three massed counter-attacks in order to restore their line but our men turned on them their own trench mortars and the divisional artillery being now apprised of the situation laid down so effective a barrage that the enemy was cut to pieces many dead being left on the field combined with the operations of the ninth brigade brigadier general d m ormond on the divisional right this movement had the effect of turning the flank of the very strong enemy position in jigsaw wood which the previous day had resisted all our efforts the garrison streamed back from the wood across the open plateau and were mown down by the rifle fire of our men in the main trench the range being so short that the shooting was exceedingly effective few of them reached their support line further to the right the ninth brigade pushed ahead and the fifty second battalion new ontario which the previous day had captured bois de vert now stormed boiry village this was the battalion that had taken damery in the amiens show but probably its work on this day will rank in its annals as a greater achievement for the men had lost heavily on the previous day and expected relief that night yet they went in with a will and a cheer and nothing could stand before them since august eighth the battalion had lost over half its effectives on the night of august twenty eighth twenty ninth the third canadian division was relieved by the fourth british division and went out of the line for a brief rest after three days ding-dong writing in which every brigade was used to the uttermost following close on the hard work along the roy road in the amiens show but although not actually in the line the general situation demanded that they should remain in close support where they were still exposed to enemy shell fire one of the most remarkable features of the present fighting indeed arose from the fact that the enemy immediately before us was in superior strength as during the course of the battle between august twenty sixth and september second he brought into action no less than eleven divisions all of which were beaten in turn coupled with this the fact that at this stage we were but fighting our way up through the fringe of his defence in an effort to grapple with his main line of resistance and it will be seen that the situation of our divisions in the line weakened numerically by their heavy losses incessantly strafed by the enemy's artillery and machine-gun fire and subjected to successive waves of determined counter-attack from fresh troops thrown into his line must have afforded constant anxiety to the corps commander it followed inevitably that an exhausted division so far from going out to rest in a back area when relieved must stand too close up in support ready for any event and thus be exposed to bombardment by day and bombing by night curious indeed was the spectacle presented by every little vale and depression in this area that lay separated by but a single ridge from the battle line and the direct observation of the enemy but which nevertheless was crowded with infantry in support massed batteries of artillery heavy and light trains of supply and field ambulances with cheek by jowl divisional brigade and battalion headquarters in dugouts and under canvas such an area was included south of the Cambrai Road between Neuville Vitasse and Guillemap, and from the commanding village of Monchy-le-Preux lay spread out like a map. 
it seemed impossible the enemy could fail to note this great concentration where a division lay within the compass of a good-sized western ranch and to pour down upon it a devastating bombardment but his gunners were fully occupied in dealing with our assaults on his front area and beyond throwing over occasional heavy stuff and maintaining a persistent searching fire along our lines of communication there was nothing in the way of a concerted artillery demonstration during these and the next few following days too our airmen had so established their supremacy that hostile scouts durst not venture over our lines in daylight these conditions however brought about relatively heavy casualties among troops lying in support and particularly among our burial parties the situation on our left the third division front has been dealt with first because the kickoff took place in the early morning while on the right to which we now come the second canadian division did not open its attack south of the cambrai road until a little after noon on the front of the second canadian division the fighting was most severe says sir arthur curry the wire in front of the friend rouvroy line was found to be almost intact and although at some points the fifth brigade brigadier general t l trimley had succeeded in penetrating the line the first objective could not be secured except one shot length on the extreme right subjected to heavy machine-gun fire from both flanks as well as frontally the attacking troops had suffered heavy casualties which they had borne with the utmost fortitude at nightfall the general line of the second canadian division was little in advance of the line held the night before although a few parties of stubborn men were still as far forward as the wire of the friend rouvroy line enemy reinforcements were seen dribbling forward all day long the fifth brigade staff had suffered severely in the amiens show when one shell had wounded brigadier general ross and killed the brigade major and a staff major of the second division present besides wounding the brigade intelligence officer lieutenant colonel t l trimley who had led the twenty second battalion with such distinction at courcelette and elsewhere was now acting brigadier later to be confirmed in that appointment the brigade exhausted and depleted though it was by the hard fighting of the previous days could not have been handled with more resolution and the response of the men was magnificent but they were up against an impossible task all the battalions engaged lost very heavily the casualties of the brigade during the two days fighting being about one hundred officers and two thousand five hundred other ranks every officer engaged of the twenty second battalion french canadians was a casualty by nightfall of august twenty eighth including the acting officer commanding major a e de Buc, with the entire headquarters staff of the battalion mostly by shell fire lieutenant colonel clark kennedy of the twenty fourth battalion whose brilliant leadership the preceding day has been recounted above was seriously wounded he again showed valorous leadership in the attack on the friend rouvroy line and upton wood though severely wounded soon after the start he refused aid and dragged himself to a shell hole from which he could observe realizing that his exhausted troops could advance no further he established a strong line of defense and thereby prevented the loss of most important ground despite intense pain and serious loss of blood he refused to be evacuated for over five hours by which time he had established the line in a position from which it was possible for the relieving troops to continue the advance lieutenant colonel john wise of the twenty fifth battalion nova scotia was wounded severely while leading his men the command devolving upon major f p day lieutenant colonel a e g mckenzie twenty sixth battalion new brunswick was killed while gallantly rallying his men and thus every unit of the fifth brigade lost its commanding officer besides extremely heavy casualties both among officers and rank and file losses to the twenty six being nine officers and three hundred and fifty men 
I never saw so many machine guns in my life, said the trench mortar officer of the New Brunswickers after the battle. They were in three tiers, three miles wide, protected by dense wire, their front plastered by shell fire. We attacked again and again, and in the intervals beat off enemy counterattacks. If we'd had tanks, we'd have been all right. What we want is tanks, tanks, and yet more tanks. It isn't rifles that shoot them guys, said a stretcher bearer at the advanced dressing station. Pretty well every man that comes down here is done in by machine guns, but most of them are good blighties with clean bullet wounds. A good idea of the character of the fighting throughout the day of August 28th is given by the narrative of a soldier of the 22nd Battalion as told the following day. On Monday, he said, we were in support. Our total strength was about 850 of all ranks. But when 50 men had been detached as stretcher bearers and burial parties, and a few men from each company left in reserve as a nucleus at battalion headquarters, our battle strength was reduced to 675. Ten o'clock Tuesday morning we moved up to the attack between Guillemap and Cherry Sea, but were held up on the ridge and lost heavily by machine gun fire, as did the 20th and 21st of the 4th Brigade alongside of us. In the afternoon we attacked again, taking our objective, Cherisy, and crossed over the dry creek bed where the Bosch plastered us with fish tails, gas, and machine guns. The colonel and our majors were wounded that day, and next day the battalion was run by subalterns. The command went down to a captain, but at nightfall of Wednesday not an officer was left, and the sergeant major of one of the companies brought the battalion out. Corselet was child's play to this. It was machine guns, not shell fire, and they raked us as we pushed up from Cherry Sea and the river over the ridge. This was about two o'clock Wednesday afternoon. We got our first objective, the chalk pit, and then went on to our final objective, the Friend Rouvroy line, a thousand yards beyond and fifteen hundred from the jumping off line. But they caught us on the wire, and only fifteen or twenty reached it. We fell back because we had no officer, bringing away our wounded. Only three officers were left of the 35 this battalion brought out of the Amy Inn show, and they were in reserve. Up to battalion headquarters came a gunner, still carrying his machine gun, with two bullet holes through it. Hello, Lieutenant, he cried. Here we are again, the glorious 22nd. Opening parentheses, quote, Allo, lieutenant, hain le voilà, le glorieux vingt deuxième. Unquote, closing parentheses. The glorious twenty second. The battalion will go on. The body perisheth, but the spirit dieth not. At brigade headquarters that evening there came a telephone call from the sergeant major. I am holding the line with fifteen men. What shall we do? Carry on until your supports come up. The following account is taken from the story of this battalion, the epic of the 22nd, by Sergeant Major Corneluc, La Presse, Montreal. Colonel Dubuc fell at the head of his men. Major Vanier lost a leg. Majors Routier, Roy, and Archambault. Captain Morgan, Lieutenants Lamarck and Lemieux, such is the entire list of those who had been decorated who were now extinguished all the glory of the past being aureoled in a bloody apotheosis in spite of numerous desperate efforts to bring him in captain morgan remained for thirty-six hours in the sad no man's land out of the twenty-two officers who took part in this homeric struggle not one was spared of the six hundred shock troops who went into battle only seventy uninjured answered the roll call. The position one was held. A non-combatant, one of those great natures of the elect, born for devotion, Dr. Albric Marin, captain in the medical corps, saved the situation. He was following the battle as a spectator, giving first aid to the wounded, when he noticed that our soldiers, deprived of their leaders, were hesitating. In a bound he leapt over the dead, the wounded, those caught in the wire. 
rallying this handful of brave men still hot from the ardor of combat he carried them along electrifying them and inspiring them to hold their ground among the resounding crashes which churned the riven earth in his own turn he fell victim of gas our chaplain father desjardins worthy successor of the noble father crochetterrier was surrounded while smothered in a gust of evil fumes left of the fifth brigade just south of the arras cambrai road in the valley of the sensee the fourth brigade brigadier general r Rini, made its third successive attack having been continuously in the line since the battle opened on monday morning but the fighting strength was much reduced and for this reason the brigade frontage was limited to seven hundred yards attacking across the open slope these fine ontario troops fought their way forward with the utmost gallantry but the men were tired and the wire in front being uncut it was impossible to reach the objective and in face of strong enemy resistance progress was slow casualties to officers were very heavy every battalion was in line and suffered severely in addition the thirty first battalion was sent up in support from the sixth brigade which was in reserve tales of heroism and sacrifice were common these three days but one example must suffice at one time when the right flank of the eighteenth battalion western ontario was held up by machine-gun fire lance corporal w h metcalf a native of dennysville maine realizing the situation rushed forward under intense fire to a tank passing on the left with his signal flag he walked in front of the tank directing it along the trench in a perfect hail of bullets and bombs the machine-gun strong points were thus overcome heavy casualties inflicted on the enemy and a very critical situation relieved later though wounded he continued to advance until ordered to get into a shell hole and have his wounds dressed this occurred in the advance of the fourth brigade on vis en artois but the men of the second canadian division did not die in vain if they had not done much to improve the line they had still held fast and had beaten back all through the day wave after wave of hostile counter-attacks intent on driving them back over the sensee our fresh troops now coming up were to jump off from the line they had so stoutly maintained were to carry on the battle into the heart of the enemy's defence and there established the canadian corps as the first of the allied troops to break through the hindenburg system at no point so formidable or so bitterly defended as here their failure glorious as it was was due largely to matters over which they had no control we fought that day with our right flank exposed for the british had not come up to our support it was only late in the day that london troops stormed the village of croisil this village was four thousand yards southwest of our right flank and the fifty sixth british division had fought their way up to its outskirts during the battle of bapaume on august twenty fourth thus for four days this line had remained static and whereas at the opening of the battle of arras on august twenty sixth the general line of the third army was considerably in advance of our jumping off line it was now refused on august twenty sixth scottish and london troops indeed on our right flank had captured the high ground between croisils and hinnenel in face of strong resistance chiefly from machine-gun posts but this did no more than conform to our advance and there being no corresponding advance on the following days our right flank was much exposed particularly from the direction of hindecourt the battle in fact was throughout a canadian corps battle receiving little or no support on either flank on the night of august twenty eighth twenty ninth the second and third canadian divisions were relieved by the first canadian division on our right and the fourth british division on our left this division consisted of first-rate english county troops and as we shall see their contribution to the general success of the canadian corps through the hard fighting of the following days was in every respect worthy of their reputation 
and none could be higher than that of the famous fighting fourth distinguished even among the old contemptibles veterans of a hundred well-fought fields they still maintained their name as storm troops and in the canadian corps found worthy company end of part two chapter four recording by james o'connor randolph massachusetts december two thousand nine Part 2, Chapter 5 of Canada's Hundred Days with the Canadian Corps from Amiens to Mons, August 8th through November 11th, 1918. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesley. Part 2, Chapter 5, Operations, August 29th through the 31st. The next four days were devoted to improving our lines so as to afford suitable jumping-off ground for the great attack on drocourt Quant switch It resolved itself into desperate and often detached struggles for isolated positions and sections of the enemy's defense. Before entering into some of the details of these operations, it will be well to quote Sir Arthur Curry's narrative. During the days succeeding the capture of Monchet le Prol, the enemy's resistance had been steadily increasing, and it became clear that the drocourt Quiant line would be very stubbornly defended. On August 28th, instructions had been received, fixing tentatively September 1st as the date on which the drocourt Quiant line was to be attacked by the Canadian Corps, in conjunction with the 17th Corps. The intention was to capture also the Canal du Nord line in the same operation. It was therefore essential to secure that date a good jumping-off line roughly parallel to and approximately six hundred yards west of drocourt Quint line. This was indeed a very difficult task, entailing the capture of the Francais Rovay line of the Vizen artois switch, and a number of defended localities of very great strength, notably the Crow's Nest, Upton Wood, and St. Servant's Farm. The 2nd and 3rd Canadian Divisions were now exhausted, and during the night of August 28th and 29th, they were relieved by the 1st Canadian Division on the right and the 4th British Division, which had been placed under my orders on the night of August 26th 27th on the left, and Brutonel's Brigade, formerly the Canadian Independent Force, on the extreme left flank. The heavy artillery from now on concentrated on the cutting of the broad belts of wire in front of the drocourt count line and the engineers prepared the bridging material required for the crossings of the sensei river and the canal du nord during the day august twenty ninth our line had been considerably improved by minor operations brutonel's brigade had pushed forward on their front and captured bench farm and victoria copse north of borny Notre dame the fourth british division in the face of strong opposition had advanced their line in the vicinity of hawcourt and remy north of the scarp and the fifty first division had captured the crest of greenland hill the command of the fifty first division front now passed to general officer commanding twenty second corps and during the night august twenty ninth thirtieth the eleventh division which had been transferred to the canadian corps from the first corps relieved Brutonel's brigade in the line, the command of that division also passing to the general officer commanding 22nd Corps on completion of the relief. This shortened the line considerably, and relieved me of the anxiety caused by the length and vulnerability of the northern flank. On August 30, following the reported capture of Hindercourt, by the 57th Division, the 1st Canadian Division attacked the Vizen artois switch, Upton Wood and the Frances Rovay line south of Vizen Artois Switch. The attack, a daring maneuver, organized and carried out by the 1st Canadian Infantry Brigade, Brigadier General W. A. Rebeck, under cover of very ingenious barrages arranged by the 1st Canadian Division Artillery, Brigadier General H. C. Thacker, was eminently successful, all objectives being captured and the entire garrison either killed or taken prisoner. Heavy counterattacks by fresh troops were repulsed during the afternoon and following night. On August 31st, the remainder of the Francais-Rovay line south of Arras-Cambrai Road, including Ocean Work, 
was captured by the second canadian infantry brigade brigadier general f o w loomis in the meantime the fourth british division had doggedly pushed ahead crossing the valley of the sensei river and capturing the villages of hocourt remy and eter pregne this advance was over very difficult thickly wooded country and the fighting was very heavy particularly in the vicinity of st severn's farm which after changing hands several times remained in possession of the enemy until september second the brilliant fighting on the part of the first canadian division major-general sir archibald c macdonnell in the days immediately preceding the great assault is admirably described in this division's own narrative of its operations as follows on the night of august twenty eighth and twenty ninth the first division relieved the second division the general officer commanding of the first division taking over the command of the line at midnight the relief was most difficult the position of the second division front line was uncertain and it was necessary for the relieving troops to form in an extended order and march forward until the foremost troops of the battalion in line was reached the third brigade brigadier general g s tuxford took over the right sector the second brigade brigadier general f o w loomis the left and the first brigade brigadier general w a Grebach, came into divisional reserve the next day august twenty ninth passed without incident except for fairly heavy shelling that was maintained on forward areas and roads on this day the plans of the army commander for an extensive operation tentatively set for september first were communicated to the division this new attack was to be made by three divisions the object being to break the drocourt quinault line overrun the crossing of the canal du nord and also seize Bolon wood and the high ground to the north of it in the meantime the divisions in line were ordered to secure by a series of minor operations the jumping-off line running from chateau wood on the right crossing the vizen artois switch and to the village of etterbicne on the left in order to understand the task before the corps as a whole and the first canadian division in particular a brief description of the ground and the enemy defences is necessary on the evening of august twenty ninth our front line followed roughly the valley of the sensee river from fontaine les carsons into harcourt where it bent back over a small ridge between this river and the valley of the congeal then over the high ground east of bernoy notre dame and continued in a generally northwesterly direction to the valley of the scarpe north of the scarpe operations were carried out merely to protect the flank of the main attack south of the stream and need not be considered here while the valley of the scarpe began to bend to the northeast practically at our front line the valley of the tranquis river began almost at once and ran due east joining the sensee valley five hundred yards east of our line from ten to twelve thousand yards beyond our line was the valley and the waterway of the canal du nord running almost due north and south cutting the canadian corps front in halves and running in a southeasterly direction straight to cambrai a distance of thirteen miles was the tree-lined arras cambrai road the natural features then were these two valleys converging on our northern flank forming an isolated triangle of ground to be dealt with then two more convergent valleys those of the sensee and the canal du nord with the high ground between forming a plateau on the right flank with a distance of ten thousand yards to go before the canal was reached and on the left breaking into more sharply defined valleys and ridges as the junction of the valley was approached with the exception of one small jog the arras cambrai road formed the left flank of the first canadian division the right flank ran thirty five hundred yards south and parallel to this road on the front of this division therefore the ground features were simple first came the gradual upward slope along the crest of which ran the hendecourt dury road and roughly paralleling our front line then came the gentle valley and in this depression was the village of cagnicourt on the right and villers les cagnicourt on the left each being about six thousand yards from our front line immediately east of cagnicourt were two small woods the bois de Bosch and the bois de loison then another ridge and a sharp valley running in a north-easterly direction with the villages of boisoy and Braille, straggling through it across the entire first division front and finally the wooded valley of the canal du nord while the natural features presented no great difficulties until the canal was reached the enemy had strongly fortified this ground 
and it was these heavily wired and strongly held trench systems that formed the great obstacle. Coming back to the preliminary task of August 30, immediately in front of the 1st Canadian Division was the 4th Nairovoye line, sighted on the slope leading up to the hendecourt dury Road. Two or three thousand yards east of this line was the famous drucourt quiant line, a switch off from the Hindenburg line, which at this point ran in a generally southeasterly direction some fifteen hundred yards south of our frontage, running in a southeasterly direction from Viz and Artois, and connecting with the Francois Robois and Drucourt Quillon lines, was the trench system known as the Viz and Artois switch, and beginning at the point where the Drucourt Quillon line crossed the Arras Cambrai road, and also running east, was a fourth line, known as the Boise switch. This system of trenches ran immediately southwest of the villages of Villers and Boisoy, joining the Hindenburg Line in the vicinity of Hiche and Artois, a village situated near the Canal du Nord and just south of the Canadian Corps boundary. It will be seen, therefore, that the trenches to be taken by the 1st Canadian Division ran in zigzag fashion, practically to the canal. The Canadian Corps planned for the attack on the Drucourt Quillant Line depended on the divisions in line securing a jumping-off position within reasonable distance of this objective. The first thing, therefore, that the 1st Canadian Division had to do was take the fresnay rovoy line, the greater part of the Viz and Anton Switch, Upton Wood, and the two strong obstacles known as Chateau Wood and the Crow's Nest, or, in other words, to advance its line some 3,000 yards before launching the big attack. As the divisional commander did not wish to incur any risk, of dissipating the strength of the two brigades earmarked for the breaking of the decourt quillant line, he decided that the 1st Brigade, in Division Reserve, should carry out this preliminary operation. The date set was at dawn on August 30th. The task confronting the 1st Brigade was no light one. There was the strong Francis Rolvoy trench line that already had stopped one attack by the Canadians. There was the vis en artois switch line, cutting this system diagonally, there was the fortified obstacle presented by Upton Wood, lying between the fresnos Ravoy line and the hendecourt dury Road. There was Cemetery Trench, running in a northeasterly direction from our right flank, and passing just east of Upton Wood. At first, it was decided to attack this area frontally. Later, however, when the brigade commander heard that British troops had captured the village of Hendecourt, thus breaching the fresnos Ravoy system, just south of his right flank, he evolved a daring plan for the attack. Two battalions, the 1st Western Ontario and 2nd of Ottawa, were to assemble in the vicinity of Hindencourt and attack northeast and north respectively, the first going up Cemetery Trench and the other rolling up the fresnes Rovoy Trench from the south. The 3rd Battalion, recruited from Toronto District, was ordered to attack astride the Vizen Astroy Switch and burst the fresnes Rovoy line at its junction with that trench. The artillery then worked out a complicated barrage, or rather two, one protecting each of the attacks from the flanks, and then merging together and sweeping eastwards. The attack opened at 4.40 a.m. All went smoothly and the objectives were taken. Heavy fighting continued through the greater part of the day, however, for soon after noon, the enemy launched a determined counterattack under cover of an organized barrage and penetrated some portions of Upton Wood and Cemetery Trench. A portion of the 2nd Battalion in the fresno Wavoy line at once started another counterattack, and so brought the enemy to a standstill, but did not drive him out completely. An attempt on the part of the 3rd Battalion patrols to take the remainder of the fresno Wavoy line that lay between the vizen Atroy switch and the arras Cambrai road was not successful, owing to the strength with which the enemy was holding it. Towards evening, a portion of the 4th Battalion, Central Ontario, was thrown into the fight, to re-establish our new line. By nightfall, this was accomplished, and the enemy driven out of those positions he had secured as a result of his attack at midday. The next day, August 31st, the 2nd Brigade, using the 8th Battalion, Winnipeg, completed the capture of the freshness Vorvay line as far north as the arras Cambrai Road, and then in daylight, and in the face of heavy machine-gun fire, patrols were rushed well forward of the captured line. The enemy fought with desperate courage throwing in his reserves lavishly, these including Prussian Guard divisions and a stout Marine division, thoroughly alarmed by the manner in which our advance was pushed steadily forward despite all obstacles. He brought against us all his available reserves, from both the Doy and Cambrai areas. This was the crucial point, 
of his whole line of defense, and once pierced the entire Hindenburg system, north and south, the fruit of years of work in which the lives of tens of thousands of Russian prisoners had been squandered, would be turned and rendered worthless. At this juncture, it was worth to him, depleted of men as he was, an army corps to prevent us crossing the Canal du Nord and driving a wedge through his west front at Cambrai. To add to the difficulties of our troops in these days of fierce preparation for the great assault, things were not going well on our right flank. On August 30, London and West Lancashire troops had taken Bullcourt and Hendencourt, the report of which had reached us and encouraged the attack on Upton Wood, detailed above. But the Germans, so runs an account, being unwilling to give up points so near their main lines of defense, attacked in great force, and by the evening had driven back our troops to the western outskirts of these villages and to the German trench line between them. While our first and fourth divisions were pushing forward, their line on the two following days, the situation on our right was not improved, and when the great attack finally opened on September 2nd, the left brigade of the 17th Corps fell in line behind our right brigade and followed up its advance until the opportunity opened of turning off south and capturing Quarant. End of Part 2, Chapter 5, Recording by Mike Mendetti. Part 2, Chapter 6 of Canada's Hundred Days with the Canadian Corps, from Amiens to Mons, August the 8th to November the 11th, 1918. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Watkins. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesey. Part 2, Chapter 6. Operations, September the 1st to September the 3rd. Drocourt K Ant Line. We have now come to the morning of September the 1st, the date of the great assault as originally designed. But a change had to be made in the plan. On the night of August the 31st to September the 1st, says the Corps Commander, the 4th Canadian Division came into the line on a one brigade front between the 1st Canadian Division and the 4th British Division. The general officer commanding 4th British Division, having now reported that he considered his division unable successfully to attack the Drocourt Cayant line on the front allotted to him, in view of the losses suffered in the preliminary fighting for the jumping off line, I decided that the 4th Canadian Division would extend their front and take over 1,000 yards additional frontage from the 4th British Division. This necessitated a change of plan on the part of the 4th Canadian Division who a few hours before zero had to place an additional brigade in the line for the initial assault. Accordingly, the 12th Brigade, Brigadier General J. H. McBrien, carried out the attack on the right, and the 10th Brigade, Brigadier General R. J. F. Hayter, on the left divisional front, having first advanced the line to conform with the 1st Canadian Division. It was necessary to postpone the attack on the Drocourt Cayant line until September the 2nd, on account of the additional wire cutting which was still required and the day of September the 1st was employed in minor operations to improve the jumping off line for the major operation. The important strong point known as the Crow's Nest was captured by the 3rd Brigade. During the afternoon and evening of September the 1st, the enemy delivered violent counter-attacks, directed against the junction of the 1st and 4th Canadian Divisions. Two fresh divisions, and two divisions already in the line, were identified in the course of the heavy fighting. Our troops were forced back slightly twice, but the ground was each time regained and finally held. The hand-to-hand -hand fighting for the possession of the crest of the spur at this point really continued until zero hour the next day, the troops attacking the Drocourt Cayant line as they moved forward, taking over the fight from the troops then holding the line. For the doings of the 1st Canadian Division on this day, there is still no better guide than the narrative already so freely quoted. Owing to the strength of the wire in front of the Drocourt Cayant line, the date of the major attack was postponed for one day, in order to give the heavy artillery further time to carry out wire-cutting operations. In order, also, to thicken the infantry attack, the frontage of the 1st Division was reduced by some 1,500 yards on the night of August the 31st, the 2nd Brigade side-slipping south. The 1st Brigade was relieved during the night, the 3rd Brigade taking over the right sector with the 15th Battalion, 48th Highlanders of Toronto, and the 14th Battalion Royal Montreal Regiment, and the 2nd Brigade the left sector with the 5th Battalion Saskatchewan. On the same night, the 4th Canadian Division came into line between the 1st Division and the 4th British Division. Once again, at dawn the next day, the whole infantry line on the Corps front moved forward. This time, the advance of the 1st Division front was only for a distance of 1,000 yards. 
the new line being established within the same distance from the Drocor Quayant line, a suitable striking distance for the great attack set for September the 2nd. In spite of the short advance, the fighting was of the most bitter character. As soon as the protective barrage died down, the enemy commenced a series of determined counter-attacks down an old trench against the 14th Battalion. Four such attacks were beaten off by the garrison of the trench during the day, captured stick grenades and Stokes mortars being used freely. On the left, on the front captured by the 5th Battalion, the enemy flung two battalions against the position at 11.30 a.m., a heavy machine gun and artillery barrage being used. The two companies in the forward position were slowly forced back to their original line. The battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel L. R. O. Tudor, however, at once counter-attacked with his remaining two companies. After four hours of heavy fighting, the whole position was regained, and 125 prisoners captured. The enemy was not satisfied, however, and once again, at six o'clock in the evening, he developed a strong attack. This effort was beaten off except on the extreme left, where two posts were captured by the enemy. Fighting in this area continued intermittently throughout the night, and, as a matter of fact, when the barrage opened in the morning for the major attack on the Drocor Kayant line, and the 7th Battalion Vancouver passed through, the 5th Battalion was even then engaged in hand-to-hand -hand fighting for the possession of these posts. During the night of September the 1st, and in the early morning hours following, while the front was in a turmoil of shell-fire and bombing, attack and counter-attack, swift rushes or stubborn resistance, the infantry, artillery, machine guns and tanks were moving forward along the whole corps front into their assembly positions for the thrust that was designed to break the Drocor Kayant line and secure the crossings of the Canal du Nord. Much the same situation was being combated by the 4th Canadian Division, Major General Sir David Watson, north of the Cambrai Road. Except for the tremendous finale of the barrage, the night of September the 1st and the dawn next day might be described as one continuous battle. Thus, from the time the leading brigades of the 4th Canadian Division took over the line, right up to zero hour, they were involved in almost continuous fighting. Due to enemy counter-attacks and isolated enemy posts, which were calculated to hamper our jump-off and must therefore be reduced. It was in such a situation that a valorous act was performed by Private Claude Joseph Patrick Nunney of the 38th Battalion of Ottawa. When his battalion on this day was in the vicinity of Vizan Artois, preparatory to the advance of the following morning, the enemy laid down a heavy barrage and counter-attacked. Private Nunney, who was at this time at company headquarters, immediately, and of his own initiative, proceeded through the barrage to the company outpost lines, and going from post to post, encouraged the men by his own fearless example. The enemy were repulsed, and a critical situation saved. The 4th Canadian Division had in the line the 10th Brigade, Brigadier General RJF Hayter, on the right, resting on the Arras Cambrai Road, and on the left, the 12th Brigade, Brigadier General J. H. McBrien, with the 11th Brigade, Brigadier General V. W. Odium, in support, prepared to go through after the attack had well developed. The left of the division was in touch with the 4th British Division, which carried on the Canadian Corps line north to the Scarp. It is a dark and stormy night, and at times the artillery of heaven drowns out even the roar of the guns. Making our way on foot from Wancor up over that ridge towards Cherisy, we pass through seeming endless tiers of guns of all calibres, brought up in the night, and waiting now impatiently upon zero. It was to be the greatest barrage of the war, and if the artillery could not succeed in cutting lanes for the infantry, we were bound to sustain a disastrous defeat. Before every show, one had to be impressed with the faith of our men in the victory of the morrow. For them it was not a thing even debatable. Certain objectives had been set the Canadian Corps, and they would be taken. It was perhaps natural enough to men who had never known failure in attack, but this was an occasion somewhat different. Exactly a week ago, the first phase of this battle had opened. For the first two days, it had gone well, a wedge 11,000 yards deep at its apex being driven into the heart of the enemy's defence. But day by day the task had hardened, until the whole line was involved in a furious battle, not so much often to win more ground as to hold what we had. There can be now no element of surprise, save in so far as the enemy cannot anticipate the weight and fury of our bombardment. He is thoroughly on the alert, and his trenches swarm with men, brought up day by day fresh from his reserves. He is fighting a last-ditch battle, on which must depend the trend of events many miles beyond the sound of these guns. And, moreover, admitting the unquenched spirit of the men, there remained the question of whether their reserves of physical vitality can endure this last ordeal. 
Such thoughts as these occur to one waiting upon the hillside a little back of the charred village of Cherisy. Below us, but indistinguishable in the night, lies the valley of the saint -Say River. Beyond it, on the right, is a veritable graveyard of Canadian soldiers that await only the burial parties. We have come so far, fought so hard, paid so dear, perhaps here for the first time to meet defeat. And that in its most sanguinary form, for it is a battle that cannot be broken off at will of the attacking force. Defeat and retreat is the only alternative of victory. The night wears away. Towards morning the sky clears, but mist still hangs low in the valley. On our left a furious cannonade is in progress, but quite local in character. There is none of that tense stillness preceding a surprise attack. Heine is overhead, flying boldly, and only darkness saves the batteries massed behind the hill. The night has turned to a grey obscurity when zero hour strikes, when pandemonium is let loose. There is here again something different from that famous morning at Gentel Wood, twenty-five days ago. A shrillness of concentration, a ferocity of intense purpose in our barrage. For the front is narrow, and the guns, set so close, are registered on a target even more limited. There is also the quick, the instant reply from across the valley, as it might be a rolling echo, beating back into our ears the roar of our own guns. Shells come from all directions. They plough up our hillside and search systematically every sunken road, every line of trench where our supports are congregated. The wicked crack of high explosive mingles with the soft purring explosion of gas shells, to the uninitiated hardly to be distinguished from the harmless dud. From the opposing slope reverberate the dread rattle of machine gun volleys, and at times these minor notes are smothered by the tremendous detonation of the heavy guns. The mist lifts a little, and dimly can be seen the trained elephants, the life-saving tanks, making their way on the far slope among the wire and the machine gun posts. Two have passed up and over the enemy defence, and for a moment are silhouetted against the dawn moving heavily forward. Then their career comes to a sudden end. One, hit in the flank, swings half round. For days to come they are to lie upon the crest, smashed almost beyond recognition by a battery on the reverse slope. Daylight now picks out one familiar feature after another. The crow's nest, a pyramidal hill half a mile north of Hendercore, Upton Wood, and the serrated outline of the Hendercore Jury Road. Our infantry are nowhere to be seen. They have passed over the crest. Instead, dark in the valley, is a moving mass soon to be distinguished as cavalry. The Drocourt Crayant Line is won. We have won the Drocourt Crayant Line, but the battle is not over. All day long it sways to and fro, and only as dusk gathers is victory secure. Here is the story in the words of the Corps Commander. At 5am, September the 2nd, the major operation against the Drocourt Crayant Line was launched. Preceded by an intense barrage, and assisted by tanks, the infantry pushed forward rapidly, and the Drocourt Cayant Line, the first objective, and its support line, the second objective, including the village of Jury, were captured according to programme. With the capture of the second objective, the field artillery barrage was shot out, and the attack further east had to be carried forward without its assistance. The enemy's resistance, free of the demoralising effect of our barrage, stiffened considerably, the open country being swept continually by intense machine gun fire. In addition, the tanks soon became casualties from enemy guns firing point-blank, and the advance on the left and centre was held up. Brutonel's brigade, reinforced by a regiment of cavalry, the 10th Royal Hussars, and armoured cars, endeavoured to pass through to capture the Marquion Bridge on the Canal du Nord. Wire, trenches and sunken roads, however, confined the movements of the force to the Arras-Cambrai Road, and this was rendered impassable by machine-gun fire and by batteries firing over open sights. On the right, however, the 1st Canadian Division pushed forward despite very heavy machine gun and direct artillery fire, and captured the villages of Cagnicourt and villers le cagnicourt and the Bois de Bouche and Bois de Lazon, to the east of Cagnicourt. Taking advantage of the breach thus made by the Canadian Divisions, a brigade of the 63rd Naval Division, 17 Corps, which had followed the attack behind the right brigade of our right division, now turned south and advanced in the direction of Crayon. Further progress made by the 1st Canadian Division in the afternoon resulted in the capture of the heavily wired Boissy Swish line as far south as the outskirts of Boissy. This largely outflanked the enemy still holding out in front of the Canadian 4th Division, and compelled their retirement during the night behind the Canal du Nord. Although the crossings of the Canal du Nord had not been captured, the result of the day's fighting was most gratifying. The Canadian Corps had pierced the Drocourt-Cayant line on the whole front of attack, 
and the extension of our attack by the 17 Corps on the right had further widened the breach, and made possible the capture of a large stretch of territory to the south. To stem our advance and hold the Drocourt Crayon line, the enemy had concentrated eight fresh divisions directly opposite the Canadian Corps. But the unparalleled striking power of our battalions and the individual bravery of our men had smashed all resistance. The number of unwounded prisoners captured exceeded 5,000, and we had identified every unit of the seven infantry divisions and the one cavalry division engaged. Our infantry had penetrated the enemy's defences to a depth exceeding 6,000 yards. In provision of the attack on the Cal du Nord, taking place the same day, the engineers had rapidly prepared the bridges and roads, advanced the light railways, and pushed forward the personnel and all material necessary for future construction. End of Part 2, Chapter 6「Part Two, Chapter Seven of Canada's Hundred Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gerald Hawkins, Santa Clara, California. Canada's Hundred Days by John Livesey. Part Two. Chapter 7 Operations September 1 to 3 Drocor to Quayant Line Continued We will let the 1st Canadian Division again tell its own story. The attack of the 1st Canadian Division was carried out by the 3rd and 2nd Brigades from right to left, respectively, the 1st Brigade being held in divisional reserve. On the morning of September 2, at 5 o'clock, the artillery and machine-gun barrage opened, and the infantry at once began to move forward into what proved to be a day of bitter fighting. The 3rd Brigade, at the time of the opening of the attack, had two battalions holding the line, the 15th, recruited from the 48th Highlanders of Toronto, and the 14th, the Royal Montreal Regiment. The two remaining battalions, the 16th, Canadian Scottish of the West, and 13th, Montreal Highlanders, carried out the assault on the drocourt quayant line, and were then to be leapfrogged by the 15th and 14th, who were to capture Bois de Bouche, Bois de Lausanne, and Cagnacourt. The 2nd Brigade, on the left, were attacking on a one-battalion front, and were using two battalions, the 7th of Vancouver, to capture the drocourt quayant system on their front, and the 10th of Alberta, to carry the attack as far as the western outskirts of Boissy. The 1st Brigade was to continue the attack from this point and secure the crossings of the Canal du Nord. The attack proceeded rapidly, and according to plan, up to the time of the capture of the drocourt quayon line on the divisional front, in spite of a very heavy enfilade fire from the right flank, southwest of the village of Cagnacourt. The tanks, of which there were eighteen operating on the divisional front, did great service in the capture of the drocourt quayon system. Strong resistance was met by our troops east of this trench line, and the attack slowed up very considerably. The battle devolved upon platoon, company, and battalion commanders, and it was only by the initiative and determination of all ranks actually engaged in the foremost lines that the enemy was slowly but surely pressed back. On the right, the chief obstacle was flanking fire from the south. On the left, the strongly fortified village of villers le cagnicourt and an isolated factory on the R.S. Cambrai Road were the center of resistance. By four o'clock in the afternoon, with the assistance of batteries of artillery attached to battalions and under cover of machine gun and Lewis gun fire, our line had been established east of the villages of Cagnicourt and villers le cagnicourt a supplementary barrage was arranged for six o'clock that evening, and under cover of it the infantry again advanced. By this time the leading battalions of the 1st Brigade 
the third recruited from toronto district and the fourth central ontario had become involved in the fighting the struggle for the capture of the buissy switch and for the sunken roads leading south from buissy was long and desperate but by individual perseverance our troops at eleven o'clock that night had reached a line running roughly north and south just west of the village of buissy the third brigade had suffered very heavy casualties during the day and were therefore relieved during the night by the first brigade the fourth battalion going into line with the second battalion eastern ontario in support and the first western ontario and third in reserve at dawn therefore of september three our line ran along the railway and rode east of bois de bouche as far as the buissy switch and then due north to the arras cambrai road with a defensive flank thrown back along this road for a distance of nearly two thousand yards after a day of intense hand-to-hand -hand fighting this was a result of which the division was proud in spite of the fact that the enemy was very strong numerically as witnessed the two thousand seven hundred forty six prisoners captured in forty eight hours of battle and that he fought desperately a fact amply proved by the five hundred dead in the area in front of the drocourt quayant line and around the villages of cognacourt and villers le cognacourt in spite of these obstacles and the high number of machine guns with which the enemy was armed the line reached by the leading troops of the first division was well in advance of that reached by the flanking divisions in fact throughout most of the day the division had fought with both flanks in the air although troops of the sixty third british division succeeded in reaching in that evening the infantry was well supported by all other arms of the service the artillery both in its concerted barrage fire and in the work of its advanced batteries was responsible for the creation of many openings in the enemy's defenses the attached machine-gun batteries operating with the leading infantry had many opportunities of inflicting casualties on the enemy opportunities that were seized and made the most of it the tanks too were a great factor in the forcing of the drill cork way out line after our artillery barrage died down however every one of the eighteen tanks became a casualty so ended the fight for the drocourt quayant line there still remained the canal du nord to be crossed many a gallant deed was done that day but none finer than that of lieutenant colonel c w peck m p for scana b c a man well into middle age who commanded the sixteenth battalion canadian scottish recruited from winnipeg to the coast the sixteenth battalion as has been seen was given the task of capturing the drocourt quayant line on our extreme right flank which was in the air lieutenant colonel peck's command quickly captured its first objective but progress was held up by enemy machine-gun fire on his right flank the situation being extremely difficult he rushed forward and made a personal reconnaissance under heavy machine-gun fire having reconnoitred the position he returned and reorganized his battalion and acting upon his knowledge thus personally gained pushed them forward and arranged the protection of his flank he then went out under the most intensive artillery and machine-gun fire intercepted the tanks and gave them necessary directions pointing out where they were to make for and thus a way was opened for his battalion to push forward he subsequently gave the requisite support to his men by his magnificent display of courage and fine quality of leadership he personally led the advance although always under heavy fire and contributed largely to the success of the brigade attack colonel peck rallied his battalion at a critical moment by instructing his piper always attached to his person to march ahead with him into action skirling his pipes the piper was wounded but another took his place some days later this piper in the casualty clearing section at duisson when asked how he did interrupted thus how is old cy peck 
and on being told he was uninjured, cried, Then if he's all right, I'm all right. In its assault on the Drocourt Quayot line on the morning of September 2, the 7th Battalion of Vancouver had, as we have seen, a very hard task, and it was by the individual initiative and daring of the rank and file that the positions were taken. Thus Corporal Walter Lay Rayfield, a native of Redmond, Washington, rushed ahead of his company, a trench filled with the enemy, bayoneting two and taking ten prisoners. Later he located and engaged with great skill under constant rifle fire an enemy sniper who was causing many casualties. He then rushed the section of trench from which the sniper had been operating, and so demoralized the enemy by his daring and coolness that thirty surrendered to him. Again he left cover, and under heavy machine-gun fire, carried in a badly wounded comrade. The 10th Battalion of Alberta passed through the 7th at villers le cagnicourt but for a time were held up. After an unsuccessful attack, Sergeant Arthur George Knight, a native of Red Hill, England, led a bombing section forward under a very heavy fire of all descriptions, and engaged the enemy at close quarters. Seeing that his party was still held up, he dashed forward alone, bayoneting several of the enemy machine gunners and trench mortar crews, and directing his fire on the retreating enemy inflicted heavy casualties. In the advance of his platoon in pursuit, Sergeant Knight saw a party of about thirty of the enemy go into a deep tunnel which led off the trench. He again dashed forward alone, and having killed one officer and two NCOs, captured twenty other ranks. Later on, he routed single-handed another enemy party, opposing the advance of the platoon. Sergeant Knight, who enlisted at Regina, died of the wounds he here received. In this brilliant action, he was assisted particularly by Private Eddie Hume of Calgary. Corporal W. Paget of the same battalion performed an exceptional bombing feat in front of Cognacor on the same day, breaking up a strong enemy point of resistance. North of the Cambrai Road, our troops, after their initial success, had before them an extraordinarily difficult task. The 4th Canadian Division attacked in the first place, Drocourt Quayon Line in front of Dury, in itself a veritable fortress. This village is situated on the crest of a slope, which here presents all characteristics of a smooth glossus, and across this, each seventy-five yards deep, were three solid tiers of wire. Behind them, and on a higher plain, ran the sunken road from Hendecourt to Dury, and in this road enemy machine gunners, ensconced in steel and concrete posts, swept the entire field of approach. Walking over this slope a day or two later, a British staff officer remarked that the position was impregnable had the enemy chosen to defend it. Ah, no, our dead tell the tale. Extraordinary gallantry was shown by the troops. In storming the sunken road, where tank aid was lacking, the 75th Battalion, recruited from the Mississauga Horse of Toronto, suffered very severely, its loss in two days being 24 officers and 310 other ranks. The 4th Canadian Division attacked at 5 a.m. In spite of numerous machine-gun nests inside our barrage, good progress was made, and by dint of stiff fighting in many places, the Drocourt Quayon line in this sector was captured on time. Just beyond the last trench of this system, the 11th Brigade and certain battalions of the other two brigades were to leapfrog and continue the advance, but the approach to the leapfrog line and the ground for a great distance beyond it was swept by terrific machine gun fire from several angles. Our barrage here had shot itself out in the first phase of the attack, and the only other weapons left were powerless to support further advance of the infantry under the circumstances. The second phase of the attack was therefore postponed until the next morning, but during the night the enemy retired to the far side of the Canal du Nord. The 11th Brigade, while waiting to go through, was badly cut up on the Arras-Cambrai Road, 
where enemy machine gunners lined the trenches on the slopes on either side, just east of the en artois The 10th and 12th Brigades lost heavily in their advance, coming under enfilade fire from the flank. But the spirit of the men was unconquerable, and even the walking wounded had no thought but of victory. The Bosch is fighting damned hard, said a Seaforth Highlander of Vancouver, 72nd Battalion. But our lot have taken three trenches and are still going strong. Beyond Dure, the ground slopes back into a depression and then over another bare hillside down again into a rolling valley commanded from the right by the heights held in strength by the enemy immediately west of the canal du nord and north of marquion and from the left by the fortified triangle of the three villages saudemont rumacourt and ecor saint quentin while the whole was swept by the enemy's heavy batteries situated on the east side of the canal on the commanding eminence of voici la vergere whence direct observation was obtained west to Dury and along almost the entire Cambrai Road. In front of these defenses, on the open ground which nowhere afforded cover of any kind, was an elaborate system of trench and wire with permanent machine-gun posts, and it was before these that the division found it could make but very slow progress. Further to the left, the 4th British Division had a task no less difficult, though different in character. On its immediate front was a high, bold hill, strongly fortified, and its left flank lay down in the valley of the Trinquis River and amid swamps and marshes. The enemy clung all day in great force to the village of Itang, which was not captured by this division until the following morning in the first rush forward good progress was made many prisoners being captured the men of the division were delighted to find themselves alongside the canadians we helped you canadians save arras last april said a wounded man of the first hans battalion and now we are pushing in with you again but to a very different tune after the close of the battle sir archer curry addressed a message of congratulation to the fourth british division as follows your task from the beginning was an exceedingly difficult one. You took over in the middle of the battle and advanced steadily each day over very bad ground against most serious opposition, finishing up by what must be for you one of the most satisfactory engagements in which you ever participated. Your success on Monday last was in keeping with your best traditions. The 4th Division testified in the most forcible manner to the fine fighting qualities of the troops comprising it. To me it was a peculiar satisfaction to have the 4th Division associated with us, because it was with them the 1st Canadian Division received its first instructions in the art of war. Monday's battle was not merely a success, it was a glorious victory. In the hand-to-hand -hand fighting which characterized much of this day's battle, loss among regimental officers and NCOs was severe. Among the wounded were Lieutenant Colonel L. T. McLaughlin of the 2nd Battalion of Ottawa and Lieutenant Colonel C. C. Harbottle of the 75th Battalion of Toronto. Casualties in this fighting were very heavy and it was only by the greatest exertions and contempt of danger that our stretcher-bearers were able to bring in our wounded. Thus Private John Francis Young was acting as a stretcher-bearer attached to D Company, 87th Battalion, Grenadier Guards of Montreal. This company, in its advance over the ridge, suffered heavy casualties from shell and machine-gun fire. Private Young, in spite of complete absence of cover, without the least hesitation went out, and in the open fire swept ground dressed the wound. Having exhausted his stock of dressings, on more than one occasion he returned under intense fire to his company headquarters for further supply. This work he continued for over an hour, displaying throughout absolute fearlessness and his courageous conduct saved the lives of many of his comrades. 
Later, when the fire had somewhat slackened, he organized and led stretcher parties to bring in the wounded he had dressed. Our medical officers, too, displayed the greatest gallantry, of which the following is an example. Captain Belender Say Moore Hutchison, who enlisted at Toronto, went through the Drocourt Quayant line with his battalion under most intense shell, machine gun, and rifle fire. With an utter disregard to personal safety, he remained in the field until every wounded man had been attended to. He dressed a seriously wounded officer under terrific machine gun fire. With the assistance of prisoners, succeeded in evacuating him to safety. Immediately afterwards, he rushed forward in full view of the enemy under heavy machine gun and rifle fire to attend a wounded sergeant, placing him in a shell hole proceeded there to dress his wounds. Similar devotion to duty was exhibited by the chaplain service. Thus Captain Graham, chaplain of the 13th Battalion, Montreal Highlanders, when that unit suffered heavy losses in front of the Upton Wood, went out repeatedly in front of our infantry line, carrying in our wounded from off the wire. He was subsequently wounded. Casualties among the battalion chaplains were particularly heavy during these operations. So ended the great battle. Following its conclusion, the Third Army south of us were able to march ahead, rescuing village after village without firing a shot. Everywhere south of us the enemy was falling back. Only to the north, behind the flooded valley of the Scarp and the Sensei, he clung to his line. End of Part 2 Chapter 7 Recording by Gerald Hawkins for LibriVox.org Part 2 Chapter 8 of Canada's Hundred Days with the Canadian Corps from Amiens to Mons August 8th through November 11th, 1918 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Vendetti, Canyon City, Colorado. MikeVendetti.com Canada's Hundred Days by John Lavesley Part 2 Chapter 8 After the Battle Fighting went on during September 3rd, 4th, and 5th, when the enemy was forced back to the east bank of the Canal du Nord. All along the line and the Canadian Corps came into possession of the watery triangle formed by the canal on the east and the Sensei River on the north. On our right, south of the Rares Cambay Road, the 1st Canadian Division had not much difficulty during the day of September 3rd, pushing forward to the line of the canal, to which the western bank sloped gently down through water meadows, the only shelter being a few gnarled old pollards on the bank from sans les Marquines. North, the area was flooded, and the enemy had good protection for his machine gunners in the woods that thickly clothed the steep eastern bank. North of the road, our fourth division had a much harder task and had sharp fighting before the area was cleared. On the divisional right, the tenth brigade fought its way forward to the canal through the enemy defense system, resting on the three villages of Saint-Mont the Conseil Quentin, and Romacourt, the latter being captured by the 44th Battalion, formerly of Winnipeg, but now recruited from New Brunswick. These villages had been untouched by war and contained great store of ordnance and material, with a complete hospital train, tucked away behind the impregnable Dorcourt Quaint line and beyond the area we sailed. He had built up there a great depot. From a distance it looks as though a pocket handkerchief might cover them. They stand intact, the churches rising above the red-tiled roofs, the whole nestling in wooded groves. The sight of these villages amid green fields is more eloquent than anything that has gone before of the success of the battle. For here, as in former years, the Bosch had settled down for the winter. He had filled them with his material of war but intact though they seem from a distance. On entering there is evidence on every hand of the process of ruin, for hardly is the enemy driven out than he pours upon them the whole fury of his rage and disappointment. 
from across the canal guns great and small keep up a ceaseless cannonade and for days gas hangs heavy in their narrow streets a beautiful spire is that of the church of Vicor st quentin but even as one admires a shell hits it fair and square and it disappears in a cloud of dust nevertheless the fields are still green soldiers gather pumpkin in the village gardens it is an astonishing experience to pass into these lush pastures from out the blight and the taint of no man's land a court st quentin must ever figure in canadian history as the village where canadian troops first rescued the unhappy imprisoned french people vive les canadiens vive les brave canadiens it was a glad cry from the heart soon to grow familiar to our ears but it was first heard at this village forty-six persons for four years held in slavery hid for several days in one small cellar when the order had gone out for the villagers to be evacuated half starved emaciated but very happy and voluble when we found them their deliverance was actually effected by major general e w b morrison general officer commanding canadian royal artillery a young girl a slender brunette embraced him kissing him on either cheek in me she cried my general the french people salute our savior with saddened hearts these poor folk passed back through the desolation of no man's land where they had been wont to visit the feats and feast days of neighboring smiling villages cagnicourt and dury chesley and Vizinatoris, now not to be distinguished from the general ruin the eleventh brigade had some hard fighting mopping up along the canal bank where enemy posts held out abstentionally brigadier general odium finally cleared up the situation after he had made a personal reconnaissance during which he was wounded slightly our twelfth brigade had a very difficult task in the marshy area between Ecourt st quentin and the sensei river the eighty fifth battalion nova scotia in particular suffered heavy casualties fighting its way through swampy ground here bisected with ditches and swept by the fire of any machine-gun post north of the river they finally cleared the area with the capture of paulol a village secure at the juncture of the canal du nord and the sensei which from here east is canalized but we were up against a dead wall the enemy had blown up all the bridges on the night of october second and third says sir arthur curry and was holding a commanding position on the eastern bank of the canal with a large number of machine-guns his artillery was very active more especially from the north and it was impossible to send bodies of troops by daylight over the long and bare slopes bordered by the canal our left flank was now very exposed to artillery fire from the north and the nature of the ground we were holding the strength of the obstacle in front of the corps and the resolute attitude of the enemy forbade any attempts to further exploit our success it was necessary to prepare minutely the details of the operation required to attack successfully the canal du nord line accordingly no further attempts were made at this time in the night of september third and fourth the second and third canadian divisions relieved the first and fourth canadian divisions respectively and the fourth british division was relieved by the first british division which had come under the Canadian Corps on September 1st, and had been concentrated after that date in the Monche le Pre, vis en Artois, Guay The left flank of the Corps was again very long, and in accordance with the policy adopted by the 1st British Division, was transferred in the line from the Canadian Corps to the 22nd Corps. I handed over command of that sector, extending from Paulel exclusively to Etang inclusive and facing north to this g o c twenty second corps at midnight september fourth and fifth the enemy had flooded the valley of the sensei river and all the bridges had been destroyed our engineers were very actively engaged in an effort to lower these floods and wrest the control from the enemy on our right flank the seventeenth corps was engaged in heavy fighting in and around mosores and all the attempts to cross the canal du nord at that point had been repulsed a thorough reconnaissance of our front had shown 
that the frontal attack of the Canal du Nord line was impossible. The eastern bank of the Canal du Nord was strongly wired and was generally much higher than the western bank. The whole of our forward area was under direct observation from Oise le Vigor, and the high ground on the northern flank, and any movement by day was quickly engaged by hostile artillery. No battery positions within a range sufficient to carry on the preparation of the attack or to support it were available and any attempt to bring guns forward of the general line villers says concord brise were severely punished the battery positions south and west of this general line were subjected to intense gas shelling every night the canal du nord was in itself a serious obstacle it was under construction at the outbreak of the war and had not been completed generally speaking it followed the valley of the river Atgesh, but not the actual bed of the river the average width was about one hundred feet, and it was flooded as far south as the lock, eight hundred yards southwest of saint lage montquain Just north of the Corps' southern boundary, south of this and to the right of the Corps' front, the canal was dry, and its bottom was at the natural ground level, the sides of the canal consisting of high earth and brick banks. The attack of the Canal du Nord could not, therefore, be undertaken singly by the Canadian Corps, but had to be part of a larger scheme. This required considerable time to arrange, and, until September 27th, no changes developed on the Corps front. The obstacle which had stopped our advance also made our positions very strong defensively, and advantage was taken of this fact to rest and refit the divisions. As much of the Corps artillery as could be spared was withdrawn from the line to rest the men and horses. The line was held very thinly, but active patrolling at nights and sniping were kept up. A complete program of harassing fire by artillery and machine guns was also put in force nightly. The Corps Heavy Artillery Brigadier General R. H. Massey carried out wire-cutting counter-battery shoots and gas concentrations daily in preparation for the eventual operations. Light railways, roads, bridges, and water points were constructed right up to the forward area and the bridging material which would be required for the canal du nord was accumulated well forward ammunition dumps were established at suitable places detailed reconnaissance of the canal and trenches were carried out by aeroplane and also by daring patrol and all available documents regarding the canal construction were gathered with a view to preparing the plans for the future attack on september thirteenth Major General, then Brigadier General, F. O. W. Loomis, took over command of the 3rd Canadian Division from Major General L. J. Lipset, who went to command the 4th British Division. The former was succeeded in command of the 2nd Canadian Infantry Brigade by Brigadier General, then Lieutenant Colonel R. P. Clark. The direct observation from Oise le Vigueur, to which the Corps commander alludes, was very annoying to our troops. The Arras Cambrai road was still the main line of our communications roads to the north being shot up by the enemy batteries now commanding our left flank from north of the river for miles back while the secondary roads further south had been blown to pieces and it took time to repair them a lorry could not pass along the Cambrai road without being subjected to shell fire and high explosive but nothing could daunt these lorry drivers personnel of the army service corps men bringing up ammunition and the drivers of ambulances the road was strewn with wrecked lorries but they carried on their task driving steadily at the speed of not more than five or six miles an hour picking their way among shell holes in the paves and giving no more heed to the dangers encompassing them than if they were teeming in their own home towns and this was not all with the quieting down of the battle the air force with the corps was reduced to the artillery observation buses and a few scouting machines. The enemy took advantage of this to send over an occasional circus, which for the time held command of the air in this sector. Late in the afternoon of a September day, one of these made its appearance from the direction of Duvai, flying high above the plateau just west of the canal. Against the leader, a lone fighting plane, whose wings bore the familiar red, white, and blue circles of the British RAF, launched his attack. Fast and high he flew, but the enemy was higher still, attacking the enemy leader from an angle below. He fired off his machine gun, missed, and swung around. But at that instant the enemy caught him with a volley, and his machine gun burst in flames, slowly fell. 
and before it had fallen far, our gallant airman jumped out and began to fall faster, faster, still faster than his machine, which followed him as might a leap floating gently to the ground. He fell into a swampy place and was buried from human ken. Encouraged by this success, the entire circus swooped low down on the Cambry Road, flying westward just over the tops of the trees, machine gunning as they went. Then, when they reached the crossroad to Dury, they swung off south, down the Dorset Quinn trench system, but a few feet above the ground, blazing away into our men crowding there in support, our archies and even field batteries directed on them. A tremendous fulsade, and our men could be seen firing their rifles, but only one shot seemed to take effect, an enemy machine limping off like a wounded duck back over the canal. The rest of the circus passed out of sight south. But it was not always thus. Old Joey, a slow-flying artillery observation plane, was loafing along one day along the Canal du Nord, when down on him swooped an enemy fighting machine of far greater power and speed. Old Joey pursued his course unperturbed until Heine was upon him, then swung smartly around, bringing the only gun to bear, and in a minute Heine went crashing. We had time to count the spoils. Since August 26th, the Canadian Corps and the British divisions fighting under it had encountered and overwhelmed no less than eleven enemy divisions, while four other divisions had been engaged partially and identification secured of elements of three more. Five complete trench systems were taken and the captured area approximated fifty-six square miles, with an average penetration of twelve and a quarter miles. Ten thousand three hundred and sixty prisoners of all ranks were captured in twenty-two villages, while the material was great beyond reckoning, chief being two four-point-one-inch long naval guns, eighty-nine heavy and field guns, one thousand sixteen machine guns, seventy-three trench motors, two searchlights, and one helio, besides wagons, horses, and vast quantities of ammunition and engineering supplies. But war is not all victory. There is the agony and sacrifice. Busy across this rolling plain are our burial parties, and it is not only the Hun they bury. Some of our men lie stark and huddled under lee of enemy machine-gun posts. Others still hang in the fastness of the wire. Long lines of Red Cross lorries move to the rear. Far across the seas, from Cape Breton to Vancouver Island, from the international boundary to remote northern outposts, soon will flutter little yellow messages bringing sorrow and anguish to quiet firesides. But they have not suffered in vain by their exhortations and their sacrifice, they have brought the war appreciably nearer its close. It is a melancholy scene down the Cambry Road through Vis en Etros past Dury, on the left and Viser Le Cardinot on the right. All is desolate. It is a typical no man's land landscape. The countryside is pitted with shell holes and scarred with trenches. Avenues of trees along the road show only blasted stumps. There is not a green thing. Everywhere is the debris of war. The litter and the ruin, broken lorries, shattered remnants of an armored car, the twisted rails of a light railway, scrap iron of all descriptions, ammunition boxes piled high. These things cumber the roadside. Everywhere are horses in various stages of decomposition. Here and there are rows of our dead, waiting burial parties. Over all is a brooding stench of decay and stale gas. End of Part 2, Chapter 8 Recording by Mike Vendetti MikeVendetti.com Part 2, Chapter 9 of Canada's Hundred Days This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Canada's One Hundred Days by John Livesay Part 2, Chapter 9 No Man's Land On September 3rd, the day after the drucourt Quillant line is smashed, the first echelon of Canadian Corps headquarters moves up from Noyelle-Villon to nouvelle Vitasse. We follow the headquarters of the 1st Canadian Division, and that, in its turn, had taken possession of a captured enemy headquarters. Two miles east of Nouvelle-Vitasse lies the village of Wancourt. 
low-lying on the banks of the Cujol, and between them is the valley where our troops in support are crowded. A secondary road, in shocking bad condition, runs east from Nouvelle Vitasse, downhill through this valley, and so up over the Wancourt Ridge, to drop down into the valley of the Sensi at Chedis. Continuing, it switchbacks over one ridge after another through Hendencourt and Rayencourt to Quillant, from the eastern suburbs of Arras through its entire length to Quillan, the road bisects no man's land, which here therefore has a depth of twelve miles. That is the segment of total destruction and does not include the tattered fringe west of Arras and east of the Canal du Nord to Cambrai. About a thousand yards east of Nouvelle Vitasse, where this road debouches from the slope into the valley, what is little more than a track turns off to the right, passing up over the Henale Ridge in a general southeasterly direction. Like so many roads in the district, this track, by the wear of centuries, has become so worn down as to present the characteristics of a sunken road or defile. A few hundred yards toward the ridge, the enemy had here established his divisional headquarters with an elaborate system of dugouts on the west side of the road, protected by the high bank from all but plunging fire. The disadvantage of taking over enemy dugouts in any situation at all is that the defense is exposed in reverse, or, in other words, enemy shells may explode right in their mouths facing that way. Nothing of the kind indeed happens here, but it is a fact worth bearing in mind as a constant feature of our advance. In the old days of trench warfare, when we thus captured and consolidated an enemy trench system, we proceeded at once to dig shelters on the opposite side, as being less exposed. But in the advance that was now beginning, and was to gain more and more impetus as the weeks went by, there was no time for anything of the kind. Not until we cleared the entire trench system and began to billet in inhabited villages did our men get any kind of comfort or shelter. For the most part they slept in the open field, each man scooping out for himself a shallow shelter, digging a pit at the bottom for drainage. This track leading up to Corps headquarters is a villainous mud hole, and in the days to follow, the most distinguished visitors, including high French officials, and our army commanders come to congratulate the Corps on its achievement, as well as parties of Canadians from London, are all too apt to mire their cars in its treacherous bottom. The dugouts do not accommodate all the staff, and some of its higher ranks live and work in Armstrong huts erected along the sunken road, but most of us are under canvas, the whole camp being neatly camouflaged with particular view to the aspect from the sky. We remain in this hideous spot, the very heart and core of no man's land, most of September. For days on end it rains. Tents are crowded close on every available piece of high ground, but the floor of each must be sunk below the surface, and in effect becomes little better than the bottom of a shell hole. Canadian engineers are soon at work laying duck walks along the road, but whole sections disappear at night, passing surreptitiously into these tents to afford an uneasy footing above the standing water. Such mysterious depredations daunt the indefatigable engineer not one whit, and about the time we move on to Quion, the camp presents a neat and ordered appearance, with a solid roadbed built up from the ruins of the neighboring villages. In early September, however, a worse situation cannot be imagined. Heine is a fairly regular visitor at night, and no lights are allowed. The bugle call and the dreary cry of lights out! lights out, is as regular as dinner hour. It is impossible to take two steps in the dark without falling into a shell hole or stumbling over wire. Very early in the morning Fritzy has an uncomfortable habit of waking us up with a fusillade, and during all these weeks he continues sending long-range shells into Arras, plastering the railway station and yards. At set intervals there is a whine overhead, and long after comes the muffled sound of an explosion. Back behind the camp, on top of Heniel Ridge, is the Corps' wireless plant, where Signals is at work day and night. From here, a wide view of the surrounding country presents itself. Northeast, across the valley, Monchy le Preux stands out a sentinel. At sunset, a few misshapen tree trunks, 
stripped of their foliage, etched sharp against the western glow, mark the ridge of Nouvelle Vitasse. For four years this desolated strip east of Arras has been the battlefield. We are situated, indeed, in midst of the original Hindenburg line. In the dim days of creation there might have been such a scene as this, the earth void and formless, but to it are added the despair and the melancholy of the blotting out of what once was a smiling countryside. Villages dotted these hills, but where once was the village park, now only are the maimed and blackened stumps of trees, and below a rubble of brick and charred timber. Even the street outlines have disappeared. Ruthless necessity of military roads has cut straight through the debris. The soil is a good light loam on chalk. Generations ago, so it seems, these broad uplands were intensively cultivated by their thrifty peasant proprietors. Now the most careful search fails to reveal the mark of a plow or any trace of the hand of man. It is as if a malignant subterraneous power had fretted the surface and robbed it of all form and meaning. Pockmarked by shell holes, great and small, scarred by deep trench systems old and new, each sunken road lined with the foul mouths of dugouts. These once bright fields are as inanimate as a corpse, shrouded in cerements of rusted barbed wire. Dreary, desolate, and gray, it is a landscape that crushes the imagination and torments the spirit. In all these years of trench warfare there has been only this nothingness in front of the heroic defenders. Overhead screamed messengers of death, ploughing up the land around them. The filthy trench and verminous dugout was their sole alternative. It is incredible that they should have endured, have fought on, have abandoned themselves to such a life in such a place for an idea, with no hope, no prospect of alleviation or change save through death and the hospital cot. In their miry squalor they could not see the bright dawn of today. Yet they took everything in trust, they grumbled, they suffered, but they endured, they fought on. This frayed fringe of battle stretches from Flanders to the Vosges, varying only in comparative terms of ruin. The Hun may take of the life, but not of the character of the French people. There is something cosmic in their mute, unconscious resistance. Not so much of the men, nor of the admirable women and children, but of the soul of a nation that suffers but does not despair. In this brooding area are to be marked the distinctions between the waning and cessation of life. Before us all has gone, but an heiress still is some sign of life, and further back the villagers, their roofs untiled and windows unglazed, carry on the daily task, dulled even to a sudden burst of long-range shelling, or the rain of blind hate from a starry sky. This no-man's land is a technical term of the war whose significance can be captured only through the imagination. Here once a village flourished, mill wheels turned, and hither creaking wagons drew loads of grain. Here processions wound up the village church, gay for the marriage festival, or white-bannered for the solemn pledge of youth and maid. Here wended also the decent funeral cortege. Here on his appointed day Monsieur Le Maire made his oration on France and her free spirit. Here the good citizens chatted at evenings upon the benches in the square, and here worthy pupils, duly garlanded, received their modest honors. It is necessary to reconstruct these humble scenes to appreciate the devastation. The areas of such villages are wiped out. Their familiar features have vanished. Vanished, too, are their children. Some are dead. Some cower in cellars at the fringe of no man's land. Some have been taken by the Hun, homeless and afraid. Here are fair lands of France. Here to the cry of the plowman, the yoked oxen strained, and in due season the binder reaped of the earth her abundance. Ordered stacks peopled the valleys, and into their fastnesses drove the threshing machine. In and out of that pleasant scene ran the shuffle of children's feet, and the bright thread of children's laughter. All are obliterated. Blotted out are the villages and the countryside. There remains the anguish of a people that would not be subdued. And in its hoarse note of defiance, there mingles as bitterest seed from the trodden grape, the pitiable note of stricken childhood. Four years of war is an immeasurable span in the life of a child. It is an implacable generation France is rearing on this borderland. 
The scene is on the road from Valenciennes to Mons, long weeks after. Our troops, streaming forward, crowd against the left ditch, another current trickling westward. It is the French evacuees, returning from liberated Mons, to seek their homes, but much against the wish and advice of the civil authorities. A woman, old and bent, is pushing a two-wheeled cart, piled high with bedding, all she saved when evacuated. A sturdy lad is yoked in front, throwing his weight on the rope. We ask some questions. And where are you going? Back to our home, monsieur, he cries joyfully. Back to our home in Wencourt. In Wencourt. These two must pass through the drucourt Criant line. End of Part 2 Chapter 9 Recording by David Lawrence in Brampton, Ontario, January 2010. End of Canada's 100 Days, Part 2 by John Levesay.